Five years ago, I started my most ambitious project, hitting the reset button on the world and taking everything back to the beginning of human history. The goal? Start from the Stone Age and build all the technologies and tools needed to get myself into the Industrial Revolution by building my own steam engine. In the previous marathon edit of this journey, we covered the progress from the very origins of humanity with the first tools of the Stone Age and entered the Bronze Age in the beginning of human civilization. In this next edit, we cover the journey it took to enter into the Iron Age and the other technologies achieved around that time. Our attempts at early Bronze Age recreations resulted in some crude but effective results. But now with a more versatile metal of iron, things can begin to start getting more and more refined as well as our skills with it. However, first unlocking iron poses a lot more challenges than bronze did and proved to be a tougher process to master. The knowledge to unlock the steam engine required viewing the world in a whole new way. If you want to expand your understanding of the world and see what it unlocks for you, consider today's sponsor, Brilliant. Ever find yourself stuck in a problem and wishing you could see it from a different angle? That's why I love Brilliant. It's not just about learning, it's about what learning unlocks. With Brilliant, you learn by doing. They've got thousands of interactive lessons that make complex topics like math, data analysis, programming, and AI click into place. What makes Brilliant truly special is how they build your understanding from the ground up. Each lesson is designed from hands-on problem solving, so you're not just memorizing, you're thinking critically and becoming a better problem solver. And the content, it's crafted by experts from MIT, Caltech, and beyond, making it six times more effective than just watching videos. Plus, Brilliant helps you build a powerful daily learning habit. In just minutes a day, you're learning personally and professionally, tuning your downtime into something truly meaningful. Check out Brilliant, visit the link in the description to try out free for 30 days and get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Check it out at brilliant.org slash htme. Some of the earliest evidence of the smelting of iron dates to the middle of the Bronze Age, around 2000 BCE in central Anatolia. But large-scale adoption of iron and the full transition into the Iron Age wouldn't occur until around 1200 BCE. In one of our last videos, we provided one theory on the cause of the transition from bronze to iron, with expensive wars in the Mediterranean destabilizing major civilizations and disrupting the crucial trade route of tin and copper ore. Both metals, especially tin, are relatively rare on the earth and need to be traded over vast distances. This made bronze expensive and dependent on trade. The primary initial advantage of iron over bronze that fueled this transition was that his ore was much more plentiful. A lit author, Louis Dartnall, explained further when I got to talk to him last year at his lab in London. Iron is actually a much, much more common metal than copper or tin that you need for bronze. So once we'd worked out how to smelt iron out of iron ore, we weren't so limited by the metal that we could use. It wasn't just the elites and warriors. It was basically society as a whole could then use iron tools because iron ore is much more widely distributed around the world. Something they talk about in my new book, Origins. All of that iron that we have mined throughout human history comes from a particular quirky period in our planet's history when literally the entire planet rusted. There was a lot of iron dissolved in the, in the seawater and then something happened and that iron rusted and just dumped down onto the seafloor to build all of the iron ore deposits that we mine today. And that particular event is called the Great Oxidation Event. Oxygen started building up in the atmosphere which rusted the iron and was oxidized and then was deposited down as iron ore. So it was very primitive uh, cyanobacteria cells growing photosynthesizing in the sea that created that event. So before that the iron was just like in the water? It, it was dissolved in the water but as soon as a little bit of oxygen started building up in the atmosphere and the seawater it oxidized the iron and oxidized iron cannot remain dissolved so it then precipitated hmm. down. Basically those then form the iron ore deposits around the world that we've been mining for thousands of years again. It's because of iron's propensity to oxidize when exposed to air the native iron is incredibly rare. Unlike native copper, which we previously were able to explore and mine in the upper peninsula of Michigan. The earliest use of iron, however, was from native metal iron, but not from this planet. Why, space sword? Several examples of early iron weapons and tools are found to be of meteoric in origin. But this offered too small of a source to make any significant impact. The actual smelting of iron itself was a major roadblock that prevented any mass adoption of iron. But it's a discovery that didn't come out of nowhere. So let's trace the path we followed to be able to achieve this next milestone. Starting at the birth of humanity, the first step was learning how to master stone tools, allowing more complex tools to be made. 
and eventually learning how to process raw clay into ceramics, one of the most crucial discoveries made by humans. Then, source the first form of metal used by humans, native copper, and learn the properties of metals and how to shape and use them. Next, we learn the concept of smelting, where you can turn plentiful ores into the raw metal, using what was likely the first smelted metal, lead, that required nothing more than a hot fire. Then we apply this concept to copper ore and tin ore, to alloy and to bronze, using blowpipes to raise the heat of the fire to the necessary temperature. Then we also experimented with a draft kiln, allowing the temperatures to be maximized even further with a cob tower that allows a natural draft to form. Iron, however, requires an even higher temperature, with raw ore smelting into iron at around 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. To achieve these temperatures, we need one more technology unlocked, bellows, which pumps large quantities of air to heat charcoal, maximizing our temperature to just high enough to smelt iron. Most often they are made using leather, a technology we also recently unlocked. The earliest evidence of bellows are pot bellows, ceramic bowls that are covered with leather and can be pumped up and down to force air into the kiln. Lauren got ours started by building the bottom shape of the bowl with cob on top of a mound of sand. I don't know. Okay, it broke. <laughs> that was like the saddest break. <laughs> Then repeat for the second bellow and make the tuyere tubes that transfer the air to the bloomery. To build the bloomery where the iron will be smelted, I used leftover stocks of sorghum from the crops that I grew last year. One thing I learned since our earlier cob kiln is that we should be using a much higher quantity of grass in our cob. This with the form made it a lot easier to build a really nice tall tower for the bloomery. While those dry, and before we get into iron production, let's first finish off the Bronze Age by casting the last set of tools we'll need to help us transition into iron. Thanks to the help of Grig, the sword casting guy, we were able to cast a variety of bronze hammers, crucial tools for working any metal, but especially iron. All right, see how we did? Cross your fingers. Nice. Yes, indeed, look at that. Oh, that looks great. Awesome. Yeah. Not great. Watch out. Look at that. Oh, that's pretty. Then lastly, and most importantly, some tongs. So crucial are tongs to a blacksmith that you often need a set of tongs to make another pair of tongs. And there's actually a Jewish myth that one of the last things God created before resting on the seventh day was the first pair of tongs. Next, we need some ore to smelt. While sourcing copper for us was a few states drive away, and tin ore an entire ocean away, my home state of Minnesota is the largest producer of iron ore in the United States. During World War II, over 75% of the iron in the war effort came from Minnesota. But now, most of this high-grade ore has been exhausted. Previously, I got to tour one of the oldest mines, Sudan Iron Mine, where this original high-grade ore was mined. We are half a mile under the earth right now, at one of the deepest points in Minnesota. But now, closed and only in historic landmark, I wanted to find a source of iron I could collect in large supply. Fortunately, iron ore is so plentiful here, it's often just thrown away. Along the North Shore, I discovered Black Beach. The unique Black Shores are actually the result of the iron industry in the area, where iron ore tailings, or low-grade waste, were dumped. While considered a waste product, they still contain enough iron to be highly magnetic. 
I collected several buckets of the tailings way back in 2017, before I had any plans for the reset, and I tried to apply the modern mining process to these tailings to make something usable. Most mining today in Minnesota is with the remaining low-grade iron ore, which is pulverized and then magnetically separated to concentrate that ore, and then formed into small pellets called taconite. So with an increasing number of ball mills, I slowly ground the ore down into a fine powder. Compared to other minerals I've similarly pulverized in the ball mills, the iron ore was a whole lot slower to grind. So I proceeded to let them run in the background for many months. As they ground, I separated the finer particles. Oh crap. I had assumed I would need to use magnets to separate the final ore, but letting the solution settle and dry, it was obvious that the denser iron just settled as a layer on the bottom and could be easily separated by hand. With the slow speed to grind them, the yield was pretty low, and needing a large supply of ore for our smelt, we came across another discarded source just a few blocks away from us to help us supplement our supply. All right, so we're down by the railroad tracks here, and uh, we've been looking for a good source of a large quantity of iron ore, and we found that there's a bunch of these little taconite pellets. So this is processed low-grade ore that's magnetically separated and processed into what is the equivalent of a high-grade ore. It's pretty rare to find these days. This has just been falling out of train cars for who knows how long, and it's just scattered everywhere. We're just gonna collect a bunch of this, so this should give us a good supply of iron ore. If only I had nice long nails. A large supply of ore in hand, we should be ready to get the smelt going. I previously tried to do an iron smelt many years ago without great results, as I mostly went in blind. So hoping for a better results, I talked to the YouTube channel Good and Basic, who have now successfully run their own iron smelts several times now. Originally hoped to do this as an in-person collaboration, but the ongoing global pandemic had to put a pin in that, and we just did a video call instead. Flip the camera around too. We are actually running a smelt right now. Oh, there's the camera. There you are. So you're run looking to run a smelt soon. Yep. In order to do the old-fashioned style of iron smelt that you're looking to do, you need extremely high uh, iron ore grade. It needs to be upwards of 50% iron. The furnace th design that we've been using, this is all mud. The soil around here is actually very, very clay rich. It's literally mud pulled out from the ground, uh, mixed with water, and then also mixed with grass. Um, and those plant fibers kind of act like rebar. Um, they reinforce it and help hold it together. It, it's actually much stronger than it looks. Mm. You would probably need a truck to push this thing over. The reason why we build it up to eight feet is to get a natural draft going. Probably the smallest we've ever done on is three feet or four feet. The catch there is that, um, you know, we use a combination of bellows and electric blowers to get the necessary airflow to get it up to the temperature. I believe the reaction happens somewhere around the neighborhood of 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. That bright orange is, is a good temperature indicator. The hottest spot is just above this doorway. So if I bump this loose, you'll see some of the temperature of the hot spot. The ratio that you put them in at is 50-50. So you want the same weight of charcoal and the same weight of ore going in every time you add a new layer. You just layer them in at the top and then wait for it to burn down. For us, I'd say most of our smells have gone five-ish hours, would you say? Five or six. It's important, if you point that way, to turn the whole thing into a barbecue. It's important to have watermelon and bratwurst and... <laughs> Um, and it turns out that there's actually a chemical reaction taking place, the um, carbon in the fire, and then also carbon monoxide um, is stripping oxygen atoms off of the ore. You wanna keep the carbon in close contact with the ore because it's not just supplying heat, it's not just the fire, it's actually the chemicals that are needed to strip the oxygen off of the ore. Thanks to the help of Good and Basic, now have some great suggestions for my attempt. Be sure to check out their channel where they have been trying a variety of different iron smelting techniques, as well as a bunch of other great content. <laughs> Now ready to do our smelts, we moved our partially dried bloomery and bellows to the site of the smelts. First up, we cut open the hole at the bottom for the air to enter. <laughs> With a few good pats. and then attach the two years to the pop bellows to direct the air into it. We also then finished up the pop bellows by building them up a little taller and added a lip to the end of them where we'll tie the leather onto it. Once the leather is attached, it creates a mostly airtight seal and by pulling and pushing the hide up and down, you can force a large supply of air into the bellows. Yay! <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> it works. Then everything was left to finish drying over the weekend. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Got the bloomery all built up, dried it out, and lit a little fire here to burn it out and finish it off. And uh, got the bellows set up, testing them out, got them working. So now we're going to load it up. Got about a pound of charcoal and a pound of ground ore. Just going to do alternating layers of each, fill it up most of the way, light it up, and uh, get pumping. Does anybody want to try this? <laughs> All right. Good job. Turn down now and see what we got inside. So we started around noon, now almost eight. Should be enough time for it to uh, have smelted. Assuming we got to the right temperature, which it seemed like we were. Having a hard time getting the bloom out to actually tell. There's a lot of it clogged kind of right along here on the ankle of the boot. I can, might have to break it out. There's the bloom. A lot of the stuff that came down here, I think it's leg. It's more like glass. This part, I think, is pretty solid iron. The thing that's glowing here. Wow! Oh. <laughs> so we put in like 35, four, at least 40 pounds of iron ore in there. All right, so after the end of a eight hour day smelt, we seem to have a pretty decent bloom. We start breaking this guy up and uh, see how much iron we have at the end. Looks pretty promising. So we got a fair amount of slag on the outside, but I think once we get inside, it seems to be pretty, pretty solid chunk in there. We can make something out of it. Move on into the Iron Age. I made this. It's pretty hot still. At this point, we've now officially made iron and brought ourselves into the Iron Age. To actually start turning it into something, the next steps are breaking it up and starting to work the iron inside the bloom. Right now, it's still mixed with a fair amount of slag, and by working the slag out and folding the iron into itself, we'll eventually create a workable piece of iron. But that'll be in an upcoming video. With this new metal, we have now officially entered the Iron Age and one of the last metals of antiquity. So far, before the reset and since, we've now sourced six metals. Copper, tin, gold, silver, and iron. At this period in antiquity, there were seven metals that were known, with mercury being the only one we haven't covered yet. But how many more metals are there out there that we actually use day to day? Well, Lewis Darnell had an interesting closing thought on that. So the, the other fascinating thing that I came across when I was researching writing origins is just how many metals we use nowadays. So. Mm. How many different kinds of metal do you think, Andy, you've got like on your person right now? Like your metal zip, maybe some coins, some change in your pocket. How many different kinds of metal do you think you, you have on you right now? Probably at least a dozen. Like most people would say kind of three, four, but actually if you've got a smartphone or indeed many other kinds of electronics or devices in your pocket, you've got probably near a 30. And the vast majority of those metals, you probably won't even recognize the name of. Rare earth elements, they're platinum roof metals, they're these kind of really exotic technological metals that we've only started using in the last 20 years because of their electronic properties for, for making uh, microchips. A tiny but powerful magnet in the vibration motor or the touch sensitive screen. All of these metals that the modern world depends on and no one really knows where they come from and they're, they're, they are very hard to mine in particular places around the world. So that is that's what's starting to dictate uh, the geopolitics of modern trade. 10 dozen rare earth elements that most people have never heard the name of. I mean, that, that's the world we now live in. Uh, thanks again to Louis Dardenal. Be sure to check out either of his great books, The Knowledge and his latest one, Origins. In our previous video, we were able to get ourselves from the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age by smelting raw iron ore we had collected 
in a bloomery and producing a bloom containing metal iron. This puts us at the transitional point in history when iron began to emerge and become the dominant metal, supplanting the previous main metal of choice, bronze. My original goal was to try and make something out of the iron bloom at the end of the video, however actually working with the iron bloom proved to be difficult. Only having a vague clue what I was doing, I enlisted some help from some more experienced blacksmiths to see if I could forge anything out of my iron. Hi, I'm Joe Marcello. I've been a professional sword maker, weapon maker, historical reproducer for the last nine years. I have a lot of various passions. Most of them involve metalworking of various sorts. Happy to be here helping, making some, um, how to make everything. First up, a spark test to see what is in my blue. I guess we'll just go down the row and see how they spark. Anytime we got the sparks on there, it's showing where the carbon content is. So you've got a pretty low carbon bloom, but there's a little bit of steel kind of hidden in there. So I think once that's all consolidated, yeah, you'll have kind of a nice chunk of bloomery iron. The difference between iron and steel wasn't known until later in history, but both compounds are actually alloys of the elements of iron and carbon. The different percentages of carbon are what make a large difference to the properties of the metals and are what separate wrought iron, steel, and cast iron. How are you telling the difference between the iron and the steel? This is a piece of wrought iron and this is a piece of 1080. So the wrought has a little bit of carbon in it. This has 0.8% carbon. So iron gives you really kind of um, lazy, fat sparks. Steel, you get a little bit of more of a straw color that kind of sprays. None of this was quite to the high carbon steel level, but there's a couple little sparks in there that told me um, steel. The bloom looked to be more, much more on the iron side of things, so. But a couple interesting sparks in there. I'm debating if we want to start hacking some of these apart. Yeah, I'd say crush them up, see if you get some nice hard pieces. Any of the ones that have a lot of porosity too, to see if we can separate them. This looks like iron, right? Yeah, this isn't breaking at all. This chunk looks reasonably easy to just start flattening it out. I'd place it right in on that block of stuff in there. Forge welding is weirdly easy. It's just everything else you need to do. Like you're, you're managing a forge, you're watching the temperature. There's, there's a lot involved, but the nature of the process is actually pretty simple. Get it hot, eventually it'll stick together when you hit it hard enough. And it's amazingly gentle. I love forge welding, like the initial welds, just lightly by hand. It's very cathartic. And then you break it to the trip hammer and beat the hell out of it. <laughs> Until then, it's pretty nice. <laughs> and I just very gently try to, you know. Is that supposed to happen? When it crumbles into a mass, it's definitely not, not the easiest to work with. We'll start with that piece. Okay, so that's bad, that's good. But out of that chunk, we basically got that usable. So. We're, um... <laughs> it's interesting because there's, there's iron in there. It's like that, there we go, like that. So it was a successful smell that's too small to actually be able to really get anything out of. So I mean like right here, it's a nice little chunk. You have iron, like it's, yeah. it's there, it's just it's in a very, very porous state. Definitely chunks all around that are gonna be usable. Yeah. Getting all of the other stuff removed from it. This one contained a little more. So, so far, this is what we're getting of usable material. In a perfect world, you get a lot, much larger consolidated chunk of iron in your bloom. And so then, instead of having to break it apart like this, you can kind of actually just work it down into a single piece. Um, with this, there's so much around it. It definitely worked, it just not efficiently. The other thing I have as a recommendation is you could look up Aristotle furnaces. They're little, like that might be a good option for like redoing this down into a usable bloom to then kind of approach this later. While successful in producing iron, it'll take some extra work in the near future to make it usable. In today's video, we're attempting to achieve one of humanity's most substantial and crucial accomplishments taking a rock found in nature, turning it into a raw metal, and forging it into a useful tool. We'll see if we can go from rock to iron knife. Several weeks ago, we started our first attempt at bringing us from the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age with the creation of metallic iron by building a bloomery and bellows and attempting to reach a temperature hot enough to convert natural iron ore into metal. While succeeding in creating iron, when it came to actually working it into something usable, the result was less than ideal. So just happy to find myself in their neck of the woods, I plan to meet up in person with Joseph and Joseph from the YouTube channel Good and Basic. 
They similarly have a deep interest in primitive technology and have been working on figuring out the iron smelting process through numerous past attempts. So since my bloomeray didn't survive more than two firings, I enlisted the help of their furnace and their expertise. But first, they tipped me off to a good location to find some additional iron ore to smelt. Down in southern Utah, there's an old ghost town called Old Iron Town. Formed in 1868 as Iron City, it was an attempt by Mormon pioneers to become more self-sufficient in their iron supply through ore mined from the nearby Iron Mountain. Mostly abandoned in 1876, it is still occasionally mined when prices make it profitable. All right, so I'm in Southern Utah right now near an old ghost town called Old Iron Town. And uh, also they still occasionally mine it still, but it's mostly dormant right now. And a lot of iron ore tailings are now scattered on the ground here that uh, are just dumped when they do the large scale mining. And all this is pretty good candidates for smelting. I have a little magnet here and I can test them out and see that they are in fact magnetic, which means they're magnetite and uh, should smell pretty good. So things too good and basic. They gave me the, the suggestion of this area. So I'm gonna collect some and we can see if this can be smelted into iron. Let's see if we can make a knife. Now with the source of the iron ore, I met up with the Josephs. Ready for the fuego? I'm ready almost for the fuego. Okay. Should be good. So I'm here with the guys from Good and Basic and I did my iron smelt and wasn't the most successful. I did make iron, but it wasn't very workable. So having to be out here and you guys have your massive one you built that you've done it at least four or five times now and survived. So far so good, right? Each time yeah. you live to tell the tale. So with a smell like this, what we typically would do is wire it with layers of ore and charcoal, just like you did. So you do both of these then, right? Yep, two to one charcoal to ore by weight. Does it matter which one goes first? Uh, I do charcoal first. Okay. First major difference is that the furnace is bigger. One advantage the height might give us is it gives it more time for the carbon monoxide to seep into the ore and to, to strip off the oxygen. The other major major thing that we're going to do is poke it with a stick. You really need to come to experts because we'll tell you, we'll, we'll give you the answer and you need to poke it with a stick. <laughs> yes. There's a couple of things that can typically go wrong that we've discovered. One of the key ones is getting enough air to come into the furnace in the first place. Basically you get the slag that drips down the furnace and it tends to cake around the air inlet and they'll actually physically block that entryway. And so if that happens, you're, you're done. You can't do anymore. There's no more air coming into the furnace. So the solution for that is to jam a stick through the air inlet hole every so often and also you run into another problem, which you can also solve with a stick, which is where the charcoal forms kind of a roof and then there's a void underneath it. And so to fix that, you poke the roof with a stick to make sure that all the ore falls down to where the fire is actually happening. So one other thing that we've done to prep for this smelt is we've done what's called roasting the ore. You literally just take the ore and you put it on a fire and you heat it up. It burns off a lot of the impurities in the ore like sulfur. Another thing it does is it weakens the ore. It puts tons of micro fractures and stress on it so that it's easier to grind up in little pieces for the smelt and then that also means that there's more surface area for the carbon monoxide to bond onto rip off oxygen atoms and leave you with elemental iron when you're smelting it you're taking the carbon monoxide that's produced by the fire it combines with the oxygen strips it off the rock so basically the more you can get sulfur and other impurities out of the way before you start smelting it um, the better off it's going to be so crushing the ore after roasting it those two steps are also a really important um, ingredient we found a really important component of our smelting process makes your day so much better <laughs> We've done it both ways. <laughs> but we are hoping that the taller furnace will increase the amount of time that that iron ore is being exposed to carbon monoxide so that it can turn from iron ore into elemental iron. We've smelted in all, we think, 10 plus times. And using this furnace, we've probably done four? I think we've done five or six. When we first built it, it was only about four feet tall um, and it was a little narrower. We wanted to go for a natural draft furnace. We wanted to have a slightly larger capacity. And so we just kept on building it up over time. And this has lasted through, you know, winters. It's remarkably durable building material. I think we could run it through another dozen smelts easily. At first, kind of, we thought it was just us that like smelting, you know, it should just work. Multiple failures meant that you were doing it wrong. One of the tough things about smelting is what a finicky business it is. So there can actually be multiple good ways to do it. And you can kind of like accidentally trip and fall into the right way when even slight variations on that would not have worked. You know, you can run your furnace too hot. You can run it too cold. I mean, there's the variable of the ore type. The weird thing to me about this process is that none of it is intuitive. Oh, I'm just going to spend several weeks making charcoal and then I'm going to spend another few weeks grinding up a particular rock and put it in a furnace, which I specially built with the proper ratios of width to height. And then I'm going to spend my entire day not gathering food or making clothing, but pumping bellows, which I had to make myself in order to force air into this thing. And at the 
end, I'm left with a black sponge, <laughs> a black sponge of coral. And I say, great, I did it. <laughs> so in the dozen different smelts you've done now, do you feel like you've become experts or are you still, still figuring it out? Very much figuring it out. The trouble is that you're dealing with natural ingredients. So this is a rock and this rock has iron in it. It has oxygen in it, it has you know, the mineral, but it also has unknown quantities of other stuff. And what that means is that even if the method would work perfectly if we were using something more consistent like bog ore, this stuff, we haven't dialed it in yet. So today will be uh, an interesting uh, experiment. So yeah, I think we would both consider ourselves more expert than we were before. <laughs> but still learning. Well, I'd say we're sophomores in the process. Eventually we'll graduate. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, I'll use that name. Yeah. Be sure to check out their previous attempts of iron smelts on their channel, as well as a bunch of other great videos on primitive technology. We ran the furnace for a little over five hours until the supply of ore and charcoal started to run low. Then we extracted the bloom, a spongy mass of melted impurities called slag, and hopefully a large supply of iron metal. While still hot, the bloom is compressed, consolidating all the metal together. In my previous attempt at the iron smelt, this is where mine failed. When compressed, the bloom only shattered due to its low iron content. We've missed the mother load. Yeah, I know, it's still in there. That's typically where it forms too, is right under the air inlet. How the heck do we get that out? Very carefully. Uh, okay, be careful. This furnace represents scores of hours of effort, and I would really rather not knock it down. The furnace that's a really good sign. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, it's 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 split in two. We can get it. Oh my word. Okay, I'll start gently grabbing them. Okay. So the issue here is that we've pulled something out of the furnace. Yes. It looks very bloom-like. Very bloom-like. And so now the only question is quality, right? How much of that is slag, how much of that is charcoal, how much of that is this, this is this is actually one of the things I find most interesting about this process. That thing does not have a visual way to tell if it's success or failure. I mean, if you're experienced, you can tell, even if you did it right. Yeah. There's no part of this where you see shiny metal coming out the bottom. Right there, I am very confident is iron. If we hit that with a grinder, it's going to be shiny. That looks really promising. Next, they set up a primitive forge, and we tried working the hunks of metal into an ingot. Because the quantities of impurities and slag intermix with the metal, it needs to be worked and consolidated heavily, slowly working up the slag. A nice little pancake bloom. We're gonna try to layer a bunch of these pancakes together to make the actual thing. So now let's heat up this one. Awesome! That looks beautiful. <laughs> I want to cry. It's so beautiful. At some point, that could be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> At some point. <laughs> so, I think we have a way more here. So if you were to make sure like me, fine. Quality is just going to cause difficulty in the forging process, but it's not going to mean that you can't make tools. Yeah, that's the color. That's the color. Hit with rock. Oh no, no, no. There you go. That's a beautiful thing right there. I'm dying, man. Uh, look, you're hitting it. You're hitting it so relatively hard, and it's ah! It ah! <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm freaking out. I can die happy. <laughs> I've had this moment. Wow! Yep. Little nickel-sized pieces of iron. These two pieces layered on top of each other in the forge. We're now going to layer charcoal gently on top. And ideally, we will find those same two pieces forge well done together. If we can do that, then we can do this entire process with some time and patience using the primitive method. Is that it right there? It is. And they're fused! I get welded! <laughs> this is two pieces of blue. This is the beginnings oh of folded steel. We just did a successful forge weld. Got a small ingot. 
we have a small ingot. We just forge welded effectively in a primitive forge with iron that we made from scratch and we did it without any metal tools. These are wooden tongs made from a split branch and this is literally a rock that I used to forge it into place. And the anvil is also a rock. We've, we've done it. We've made iron from scratch. In Africa, there are some regions that had iron first. And just let that sink in for a second. They took this process, they took it far enough to have iron bladed weapons like spears first. So he's, he's just... Just barely hot enough. I have here a piece of very, very large bloom. Running short on time and daylight, I took these very promising ingots home to finish processing into an actual tool. All right, so Utah ended up going pretty late into the night with the good basic guys. So we weren't quite able to fully forge these into something, but we did manage to make some actual pancaked metal, be able to flatten it out, which is where I'd failed with my previous smelt, where it would just shatter. They so we were able to layer and then forge weld together, which uh, proves it is steel. Steel and iron, it's a combination of both. I'm back home now in Minnesota, where it is quite noticeably a lot colder, but I got the forge going, and I'm going to try and finish forging these off and see if I can make something usable like a knife. But the big bloom, we didn't have a chance to fully work on in there right now, heating up, and then we're gonna start adding it and layering, and hopefully make something useful out of it. This is the other one. Trying to find some pieces of iron. Challenge with the charcoals, they look very similar and they're hot. So here it is, the end result. Wait, no, this is the bespoke knife they gave us. Here it is, the knife I made from a rock of iron to an actual iron tool. Admittedly, it's pretty small. We started with a pretty large chunk of bloom but as I worked it down, all the little pieces came off, got pretty small in the end. After polishing it off and grinding off some of the surface oxidization, it is definitely iron, as you can see the silverness behind it. There is no doubt that iron has been made, and that this is now a tool. It has a bit of a cutting edge, although it's very small, probably not the strongest, it is a iron tool. Admittedly, this is probably the worst way to learn how to blacksmith using a very poor iron that has been definitely a challenge <laughs> over two days of blacksmithing of trying to kind of flatten and pancake and then stack them and layer them forge weld them together to try and kind of consolidate the iron and compact it together it's definitely been a lot of work and the result has been very frustrating it's just how small it wound up and really couldn't even forge and shape it too much to what i really wanted I ended up mostly grinding it to the desired shape so it's been a big challenge it's been very frustrating and the end result right now is not that great. Like a more experienced blacksmith could probably produce something better, but someone who doesn't really know what they're doing, I don't know how they would have figured out how to actually make high quality steel. This is iron, it cuts, it dices, it is a tool. Maybe more of a letter opener, but I think we can very confidently say
say we are now in the Iron Age. Probably one of the more disappointing things is just how much kind of scrap just kind of broke off from the bloom as I worked it. Uh, but this isn't waste. In their video with the Good and Basic, which I highly recommend checking out, they build an Aristotle kiln and experiment with kind of salvaging a lot of scrap metals, leftovers from blooms, and also nails and other scraps like that. So it's kind of a way to reprocess other forms of metal. So my intention is to kind of replicate that myself. All of this scrap, somewhat successful bloom from my first smelt, combine all together, do a bit of an Aristotle furnace, reconsolidate it, and hopefully we can get some larger pieces of metal and make some more substantial metal tools. So definitely check that out. They are also doing an extended video of their primitive 14 using just stone tools. So also check that out. So a huge thank you to them. It's really great meeting up with them and being able to get their help. Thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. If you want to see us continuing this journey of rebuilding civilization, be sure to support us on Patreon. And if nothing else, thank you for watching. In several of our last videos, I've now attempted to smelt iron a few times to get us into the Iron Age, each time succeeding in producing iron, but nothing that was super effective for actual forging and blacksmithing. A lot of work later, and I was able to forge a super small and thin blade, but an iron tool nonetheless. So now, ready to fully unlock iron, my goal is to get to the point of making at least one solid ingot, so I can start from that point moving forward for all my upcoming tool needs. Taking some advice earlier. Look up Aristotle furnaces. That might be a good option. Redoing this down into a usable bloom. And what I got to see firsthand while working with the guys from Good and Basic, I constructed an Aristotle furnace. Acting as basically a small bloomery, it allows me to enter a high enough temperature to again consolidate all of my scraps from my first two blooms into a more solid and workable bloom of iron. Since I have made iron at this point, I'm also going to mix in a collection of scrap iron to help add a little extra volume to our bloom. After doing a preheat the night before, adding all the scrap metal, and then later all the actual bloom and scraps we've had so far from our other attempts, and then ran it for all of the next day. The end result is a new bloom that should hopefully be a little bit more successful and a little bit more consolidated. All right, so this is the very end of it now. We've been running it for uh, five or six hours. I consolidate as much as possible with a big stick. And uh, we got a pretty solid mass at the bottom. I think it's pretty promising. Let's check it out. Let's see if we got a nice bloom at the bottom. Once again repeating the same process I did in my first couple of attempts, a lot of the bloom still was not consolidating and would just shatter. But eventually working through all the pieces, I found a few promising chunks that I was able to flatten and stack, and with a little help with some borax, eventually form into small ingots. Now I can say I finally unlocked a promising starting point for some real blacksmithing. So let's meet up with an expert smith to learn some basics and get my collection of iron tools started. All right, so I'm here with Alex Yeel, the blacksmith extraordinaire. I just like making stuff, <laughs> that's about it. So I've been working my way up through the Bronze Age and now into the Iron Age. I have a few different bronze tools, but I need to start making iron tools and you're kind of the expert. What, what do I need to make first? I think one of the first things you've got to make is a pair of tongs so that you can hold the iron. Those bronze tongs look awesome, but they're going to heat up fast. They're going to you know, be a little bit soft. One of the key things is being able to hold the metal. So if we make some iron tongs, you're going to be well set to make whatever it is you want to make from there. Use those tongs to make more tongs, all that good stuff. Let's give it a shot. So I'm going to take the round side of our hammer, line up the bar here. Now I take a left turn. I come to the far side of the anvil. Another left turn. And so what we're doing is we're just isolating mass for the jaw, for the pivot area, and for the rings. You're up with the round side of your hammer, you're aiming in the middle of that edge. Very good. Feel for the shoulder, you've got it. Two hard blows. Love it, good posture. 
There we go, good. Now we're gonna make a left turn, then we're gonna come up to the far edge of the angle. Just make sure you're slow enough with your blows so that every time it moves after you hit, you can reposition. Perfect, love it. Great, and let's take another heat. Now we have our shoulders set. And now let's go back through the whole thing. So let's start at the jaw, then onto the pivot area. Great, and then take a left turn. Got the steps down. You've broken down the jaw, the pivot area, the transition to the reins. I'm gonna come down and begin making those reins right here. I'm gonna start drawing out the bulk of the reins. Here we go, we start thinning it down. I use this far edge of the anvil because it's really aggressive. So much so that it actually, if you look really closely, it is actually getting hotter from hitting it. Get off of there. Let's... Look at that, it's like half a pair of tongs already. Now with the flat side of the hammer, every time you hit, I want you to turn 90 degrees towards you and feed in a little bit. Very good. And then we'll take another heat and we'll do the exact same thing again. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take the corners off of this and then rounding it. You imagine you're a lathe. So just keep rotating as you hammer. Very nice. All right, Andy, we have made half a pair of your tongs. We're making one half here, and then we're making another half flip the other way. Make them all in one piece. Theoretically, we then don't need tongs to make tongs. Apart from the tongs that I'm using right now to cool down the tongs that we're making. <laughs> in which case, we do need tongs. But you could do this with a leatherman, or your teeth if you're particularly brave. It's really funny material, because as I'm working this, it's like working with a floppy bit of spaghetti, you know? But by the time this is done, it's gonna be a really stout pair of tongs. So, this is one half of our tongs. We just gotta cut it off and do the other half. And then from there, we'll be able to finish off the jaw section. It's like a sculpture. Good. And then we're gonna work it down some more. But right there, we're gonna make another shoulder. And we'll keep thinning that back down. Outstanding. Jaw, pivot, reins. That's one pair of tongs in one bar. I'm gonna have you hold it while I punch it, okay? So I'm gonna hit it, and I take the tool out. Hit, take the tool out. Ta-da! <laughs> about 80% of the hole got moved, only losing about 20% of the material of the hole. This time, I'm gonna hold it. Don't hit your hand. Perfect. There we go. It's amazing. We're gonna flip it over. Oh, so it's basically out of there. Hey, hey, look at that! Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a groove in it. This is what is gonna grip our stock. You can also do a little cross hatching on the tongs. There we go. There we go, that's it. Perfect, and then rotate as you hit. Woohoo! As they say in them southern parts, yee-haw. Two halves of a tongue. Take one half, hold it over the round hole on the anvil, put the drift in, and then pushing back and forth in the hole, you'll drive the drift through. That's one drifted hole. Perfect. Love it. Well done. And we need to put a rivet in there. Because we need half the material on one side, half the material on another, we need to support these tongs halfway up where the rivet needs to be. Put the rivet through our hole, put the rivet in this hole, break the rivet off, drop the half piece of steel, hammer over the rivet, and I'll have you rivet over the other side. Very nice. Riveting, I should say. Ha 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 ha. We need to get them loose. We're just gonna work it back and forth. And because it's hot and malleable, the stuff's gonna move around and be good to go. Let's get them to hold something. So we'll heat them up and we'll get a little bit of bar and we'll shove it in there. Give it a little hammer, and there we go. That's all it takes. I present to you, Andy, your own tongs. Awesome, get the necessary testing. This will definitely be useful. Thank you for the help, and uh, be sure to check out Alex Steele's channel for all your blacksmithing knowledge. We just look at the camera very awkwardly. <laughs> It's all good, they're all gone now. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so thanks to Alex Steele, we now have a set of iron tongs. I got a little bit of an introduction to blacksmithing. Right now we're back. It's kind of a new set working on for kind of building a blacksmithing studio. It's still under construction. Oh, don't show over there. I'll eventually get it set up with a primitive forge and uh, we can kind of do this period authentic 
forging. I've done primitive uh, forging a few times now in just a pit. I'm gonna move on to a gas one just for kind of efficiency as I kind of get the hang of blacksmithing and then eventually want to go back to the more primitive method. Now that we've kind of conducted the, the first step of making some actual workable iron of making some billets, we can actually start making some more iron tools. Now that we have unlocked a small piece, got a few more here of larger size. I'm gonna combine them and try to make an iron hammer. As uh, Alex Steele mentioned, the bronze will work, but it's a little bit softer and uh, it conducts heat a lot better. So it's kind of sucking heat out a lot faster, which when you're forging something, you want it to stay hot as possible. I'm gonna try and forge weld a few of these pieces together to get a nice sizable chunk, then shape it. And then like how Alex Steele had his, we want a flat end and a round end. We can both flatten and move the metal. Let's slide up the forge. Now it's hammer time. All right, so I got two sets of the billets pretty well forged well together now. They seem pretty solid. Now I'm gonna stack them on top of each other. I'm not sure if I should stack them for tall and then hammer them flat or do two by two. But I think I'm gonna try just two by two, see if that works. Maybe it doesn't make a difference. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. All right, so after a bit of work, I have two hammers now hafted onto a handle. The first one ended up just in the process of trying to forge weld it. Struggled a lot with that. Ended up shrinking a lot, which apparently that happens, I guess. Have some basic tools now. I think one of the biggest challenges is kind of knowing what tools you need and then having those tools to do the right processes. So having only a few tools makes it pretty hard. Um, the bronze tools, did the job, but uh, had hit it so hard that I have uh, cracked both of the handles of the hammers and the anvil rock that I was using has now shattered. So gonna need to work on some additional tools as well. The tongs from Alec were very useful. Now I have basically the beginner set for blacksmithing. So it's pretty obvious that I have a lot to learn with blacksmithing and it's a little bit harder than I was expecting. So moving forward, just to keep our goals moving, I'm gonna be bringing in some extra help. Now that we've gotten into the Iron Age, we're gonna focus on our next kind of power multiplier and that's going to be power itself. Some early forms of powered tools, such as the sawmill. I'm gonna start trying to capture things like water and wind, get a little help so we don't have to do this by hand. This will be kind of setting the foundation for the eventual goal of the reset, which is our own industrial revolution and steam engine. We'll be working on that next. Thanks everybody for watching. And thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. If you wanna see us reach some higher milestones like this, consider supporting us. Thanks for watching. After several attempts at mastering iron, we can finally be satisfied with some solid results. Let's move next to another important invention from this era, the crucial technology of paper making. Paper is a pretty inexpensive commodity that's easily used and just thrown, costing as little as half a cent for each shade of paper. Today, we are only becoming conscious of our paper usage as environmental waste, especially as we head further and further into the paperless digital world. This makes it hard to imagine that for a significant period of time, there wasn't a concept of paper, and its invention was a pretty big game changer in history. Today, we're gonna explore that and see how much it would cost to make a sheet of paper starting all the way from scratch with a tree. So far, our focus has primarily been on the Near East with some of the first developments of humanity's discovery of agriculture, bronze, and iron. But now, we begin to start to expand our focus a little more to the East as we cross into what is considered the four great inventions of China, several of which we'll be covering in our upcoming videos. Today, we start with the invention of paper, 
Previously, we explored some of the predecessors of paper that we used in the Near East, with clay tablets and papyrus, both of which offered some challenges with their frailty and expensive production methods. In China, however, a cheaper and more effective solution was found by the production of paper using the inner bark of mulberry trees. Soon afterwards, hemp was added, usually from old cloths or fishing nets. So let's attempt to recreate their process and invent our own paper. For that, we'll need to source the fibers to make the paper, we'll need to construct an instrument to help break down the fibers, and we'll need a frame and loose cloth to use to form the sheets of paper. First up, we need the mulberry bark and hemp fibers. While raising silkworms earlier this year, we discovered some mulberry trees nearby. This inside part is the part that eventually breaks down and gets made into paper. Paper was first made using the mulberry tree. We found one, we're gonna take a few branches and take it back to the studio and see if we can make some paper. Hopefully it works. No, oh, that one's alive. Oh, there we go. Big boy. Get the ax. <laughs> don't film this. Beautiful. Thought I'd bring the sticks out for a beautiful day at the lake. <laughs> a nice way to make sure that the sticks are gonna be ready to be debarked is to soak them. So I'm gonna throw them in the lake, wait a day, come back, and then start the debarking. Looks like there's some ice. <laughs> beautiful day. Let's just throw it out and see if it works. <laughs> no. <laughs> Make a pocket to slip the sticks into. <laughs> Needing a bit more bark, we trimmed a large branch and proceeded to cut up and also soak it. The rest of the wood will be useful for some of the other tools we'll be needing to make. Next up, some urban harvesting of wild cannabis hemp. All right, all along the train tracks here, we have found a very special crop that we'll be using <laughs> to make paper. Okay, I think we can just kind of, okay. <laughs> Next, to break up the hemp, beat it with a stick. This helps separate the hard inner core from the stringy outer fibers that we're after. Thoroughly soaked, the mulberry branches should be ready to be debarked. These sticks smell bad. So we're going to peel the bark off and eventually we're going to only want the inner bark and taking the dark bark off. Ooh. And then as you can see this one will separate out. Get rid of it. Cool. Ooh. Okay. With all the fibers prepped, next comes the laborious process of breaking down the fibers even more. We'll start first by boiling everything over a fire. Meanwhile, let's prep the final tools we'll need for making the paper. Using the saw we forged in my last video, cut the mulberry branch down into some pieces to form a large mallet we can use to beat and break down the fiber. Hammer. Next, the decal. Basically, just need to construct a square frame to hold a piece of cloth the fibers will collect on. So let's use my saw to cut some square pieces of the lumber.
Next, attach them. Let's try and forge some crude iron nails. For the loose cloth, we still have the fabric left over from when Kate built a warp weighted loom and wove it. The tools all built back to the boiling fibers. Adding the soda ash. Right now, we'll bring it up to a boil. All right, so now that we've boiled the paper, well, the soon to be paper, in order to break it down, I'm gonna use this mallet and give it a few good whacks. So this process is actually gonna take a while. We have processed this quite a bit already, but it could still use a couple more cycles of boiling it, giving it a one, two, a couple more smacks, and getting all these big chunks out. So right now I'm gonna go through and pick out the bigger chunks that didn't get broken down. This guy, gone. This, don't wanna see ya. Hey! Over the next few days, we continue to alternate between boiling and mashing it and picking any large chunks out of it. So these are our paper fibers after they've been boiled and they're still a little bit too long. So we're going to attempt to chop them up and so they'll process <laughs> a little easier. All right, <laughs> it's kind of working. All right, so that, uh, kind of turned out to be a little bit of a mess as the Kopesh is historically more of a slashing tool versus chopping, um, and it really, you can tell. So I think I'm just gonna do some handiwork here and try to break it up by hand, make it a little more manageable. All right, so we have a nice mush here of mulberry and hemp fiber. Next, we can add it to the water and create a nice slurry that will then pull the screen through. Loosely woven cloth on the wood frame that should collect a nice even layer of paper onto the screen, which will then dump it onto the felt here and then stack some rocks on it to press out any water, let it dry overnight, and by morning, we should hopefully have some paper. Not 
great. What a beautiful piece of paper. So I think that worked. The Dreckel is not, not the greatest. Uh, very crude instrument, but it seemed to have done its job. Straightened the water, held it to the frame. It was very hard getting it to be uh, kind of attachable and detachable. So that makes it a little bit more difficult when you have to like remove it and they just have crude nails to hold it on. But it did work. I think we got a decent sheet of paper. See how well it dries under the weight. Well, the paper dries, let's get ready to write on them by turning back to my written language I started at the beginning of the year. As with any major developing civilization, it was important that we achieve the milestone of inventing our own written language and record. So replicating the process many languages took, I pretended written language was entirely forgotten and built a new one based off a of phonetic sound, each represented by a pictograph, then simplified them to be easier to draw. Since then, I left my language to my Discord channel to work on evolving it for me, as all written language has through thousands and thousands of years of use. Now checking back on it several months later, I have a new generation of text that has gotten simpler and clearer to write, and in the process starts to lose any relation to the original pictographs, very similar to the evolution of the modern alphabet. Well, I'll let these guys dry overnight, and then I can take off the weights and see how they turned out. <laughs> Okay, so after drying overnight, we have the completed sheets of paper. Getting an even consistent thickness to it is definitely a challenge. Some of them are a little less compacted, um, but the end result is definitely paper. So it's definitely uh, an art to be learned, but this is definitely a piece of paper. Definitely succeeded, could write on this. Very satisfying how, how well it actually turned out. Years ago, I tried then to do a wood pulp paper and uh, failed miserably. Before this, we kind of explored some of the options of clay tablets and papyrus that uh, had issues of being really difficult to produce and a little bit fragile. So paper is uh, pretty durable, and most importantly, it's relatively cheap to produce. Kind of revolutionized things by making it uh, cheaper and easier to use. However, that's after you've kind of already figured out the system and are able to maximize it to make some huge batches. To figure it out on our own and build all the tools, it took about 28 hours of labor to uh, make just a single sheet of paper. So using modern minimum wage, $228. Kind of expensive. Paper was very useful and was widely used in China after its invention. Possible uses were both for writing and also as wrapping paper. So we're gonna use our paper and use the newest generation of our language to write a letter. And Lauren's gonna wrap some presents for our patrons. Next up was the discovery of a very important process called distillation, which paved the way for the discovery and isolation of many chemicals and compounds. It is a foundational process for the evolution of alchemy and chemistry, and can also give you some tasty moonshine. Most years we know the old adage of turning lemons into lemonade, but what if life's been a little bit more cruel in the year 2020? Well, when life gives you garbage, let's make hard liquor. In today's video, we are exploring the history of distillation by attempting to make our own still out of clay and using it to distill our own moonshine out of fermented food scraps and other discarded products. Let's see if we can just take some dirt and trash and commit a felony. At this point, we've covered the fermentation of starches and sugars into alcohol a few times, a practice that dates back potentially as far as 13,000 years ago. However, the yeast culture that produces the alcohol reaches a maximum alcohol concentration by around 20%, which prevents any further fermentation. To produce a beverage with an even higher alcohol concentration, another step is required 
called distillation, where the alcohol is separated and concentrated. Most forms of modern liquor date more recently to the Middle Ages or later. But the history of distillation is much more ancient, with the earliest evidence dating to 3000 BCE of a terracotta distillation apparatus from the Indus Valley. Distilling is a crucial process for chemistry as it allows the separation and concentration of different chemical components by taking advantage of the different boiling points of chemicals. Because alcohol boils at a lower temperature than water, you can heat a mixed solution and the alcohol will boil off first. Using a still, you can then collect the gas vapors and allow them to cool and condense in a separate container. As early alchemists learned and perfected the skill, the groundworks for modern chemistry began to take form and open the door to many later discoveries. To learn how to distill our own alcohol, Lauren and I paid a visit to a local distillery to learn more. We're at Studio Distilling and take it away. <laughs> I'm Shelly, I'm a manager partner here at Studio Distilling. We craft whiskeys from grain to glass. We make stuff from scratch just like you guys are. So we are literally bringing the grain in house. We mash it, ferment it, distill it, age it, bottle it literally by our hands. So it's, it's truly the from scratch process. We're really doing everything from the grain on up. I actually dressed this guy up as Frankenstein for Halloween. It was our monster mash. Got the bolts Yeah, already. the bolts. He had one big eye, one little eye, and a happy face, yeah. What is this when it's not Frankenstein? Just the normal mash tank. Um, basically, it's like a big soup pot where you're trying to suck out all the good flavor from the grain. You're also taking that grain and breaking it down into more simple sugar. After mashing, we go into fermenting. So you take that lovely, delicious, sugary, watery, grainy mixture, and you add it to our fermenter and use yeast that we know that is good for making beer or whiskey. Yeast eats sugar and as a byproduct they make alcohol. If we were a brewery this would be our beer. Ours is gonna be a grainy, chunky, sour beer. We go on and then process it into whiskey. It's kind of intimidating. It's beautiful. It's like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So what are we standing in front of? This is our distillation unit, or still. It's basically a lot of copper and stainless steel. It's a fancy heating element to make alcohol. Okay, so what is the distilling process? Distilling is, is very similar to the brewing process in that we're making like a beer, alcohol, water, yeast, and grain in it. We're trying to separate out just the alcohol to make condensed spirits. So that's what the still is for. So you put it into our distillation unit, you heat it up, and alcohol will boil at 173 degrees, where water won't boil till 212. So you're able to turn that alcohol into a vapor and pull it out of solution. It basically goes up as a vapor, recondenses, and then pours out as alcohol. I know that when we're making ours, we kind of run into like, we don't want to go blind. Doing this process, there are different uh, chemical types of alcohol that are coming off the still. And the first part of that is methyl alcohol. That's the stuff that comes from prohibition that can make you go blind. It tastes really nasty, it smells bad, you don't want it anywhere near spirits. So distillers who know what they're doing will clearly throw that away. Okay. It's a very small amount. In a huge run, we maybe get half a cup. Oh, okay. After that are things that are called heads. Totally fine to drink, don't taste good either. So that doesn't get put into modern day spirits. Then you have your hearts, which is the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And then tails has almost too much going on. So for people who are building stills and don't know what they're doing, this is why it's regulated. You really have to understand what you're doing because it can be deadly. Part science, part artistry, part, you know, understanding. Now to get our moonshine started. Okay, well, our first step in the distillation process is to ferment. So I'm making a fermenting pot and we're gonna put all of our food waste in it and hope that it ferments and we get to collect all the stuff that we want and later distill it and make moonshine. Next is still. Ours will be a pretty simple design. One large pot at the bottom where the solution will be boiled over hot coals, then a pot on top where the alcohol vapors will condense and then funnel down and out the tube. Returning to the potter's wheel, I attempt to get a better hang of the skill, however my skills are still pretty rough, so I had better luck using it more as a slow wheel. For the second piece, I struggled a lot trying to get it to take shape with the multiple layers and ended up taking a bit of a weird turn before I called it done. As a backup, I lower and make a simpler option too that was a little bit more likely to work. We also made a little stand for it so it could sit firmly over the coals, not risk tipping over and spilling our precious cargo. 
So I got all the pottery fired and uh, turned out pretty good. So next we need to make them actual waterproof because just fired clay is actually porous and any liquid you put into it will slowly leach its way through the pores in it. So to seal it, you need to apply some other coating. Previously when I did beer, I used a pine pitch that was historically used to waterproof a lot of containers for fermented beverages. If we advance a little bit further in history, we're entering into the era of glazes. Which came a little bit later, creates a watertight seal on everything and gives it a nice glossy final result. So there's a few different ways it can be done. Glazes can kind of be accidentally produced by firing them with actual fire, where the wood ash itself will kind of create a natural glaze. We know this in St. John before with the original ceramics episode, that had a natural wood glaze from all the wood and the rice hulls that were burned with it. As we get further into history, glazes become a little bit more kind of figured out and they're able to do more custom ones. It's kind of the precursor to glass. A lot of same ingredients, a lot of same concepts. It's basically a layer of glass that is adhered to the outside of the ceramics, creating a waterproof seal. So I have a lot of similar compounds I've already used in my pursuit of glass that can now be used for making the glaze. So I've got a few different options. Glazes come in a variety of different recipes. I'm just gonna kinda invent my own based on a few recipes I've looked at and see if we can make something just decent. Um, so first up, I have some wood ash. This is kind of a very basic core fundamental glaze. I'm gonna combine it with just dried clay. It's gonna act mostly as kind of a binder to hold it all together. We have some pumice. It can be used in a few different glazes. This is from a mine we collected in California. Then we have the natron that I collected from a lake in Wyoming and dried out. This is uh, still smells just as bad as it did then. I collected this with the purpose of glass making because it contains sodium carbonate, which is a really useful flux. Another even better flux that I found when I was making glass is borax that we collected in California. This will allow us to have even lower firing point so we don't have to necessarily fire it as high of a temperature and get a better result. And then lastly, I have a little bit of the crushed malachite that I originally smelted into copper. And this is copper carbonate in here, and this should just give it a nice hue. Um, right now it's green. I'm not sure what the result will be when it's fired. It might turn out blue, it might turn out green. Should just add uh, just a little bit of color to our ceramics and uh, make it a little bit prettier. So I'm gonna mix these all up into a slurry and we can give it a shot, see if it works. Now to start fermenting. First, we'll need to get our garbage. Over the year, I've been growing a nice collection of different vegetables for various projects. So let's collect a few of those, and save all the good parts for future projects, and claim the waste for our booth. Barely in the ground now. Boy, that's a big boy. Mm, weird looking carrot. That's the carrot. We'll need that. For a few extra ingredients, also did a little dumpster diving. In order to make our trash mash, we are going to be taking all the usable parts of the food and getting rid of it and just use the trash. So we're talking the potato peels, the skins of the beets, all the roughage stuff. Gonna put it in the pot and eventually ferment it. No drinking part. <laughs> Do you think the silkworms are looking down on us from silkworm heaven? I like to think that they are. <laughs> He's got beady eyes. <laughs> I got corn water in my eye. <laughs> that's, his, that's his noise. <laughs> I've only got eyes for you. It's like a carrot joke because it's supposed to make your eyesight better. I know he's got the knife. <laughs> <laughs> Die! <laughs> it's all going in the bad pile. <laughs> then cut all the trash into even finer bits to prep it for the mash. We 
brought the mash to a boil and then added the crushed malted grain. The grain provides an enzyme that helps break down the starches. Now that it's cooled down to about 75 degrees, we can add the yeast. Once we add the yeast, we're gonna seal it up and it's gonna begin the fermentation process. It smells like alcohol. While that ferments, let's see how many felonies we've managed to commit so far. Moonshine is the official name for any distilled beverage produced illegally without knowledge of the government. But historically, it was the name of any clear, unaged whiskey. Its history in the U.S. dates back to during the Civil War, when non-registered stills were first outlawed, but came to greatest prominence during Prohibition in the 1920s, when all alcohol production and sale in the U.S. were banned. Named Moonshine because it was distilled at night to avoid getting caught, tend to be notorious for being potentially toxic because old automotive parts were frequently used to build the still and because of potential inexperience of the distiller. Is it illegal to make a still? Technically, the law is even written in Minnesota that even possessing a still is a felony, but <laughs> the law is also contradictory, so even the laws are still being rewritten from our prohibition history. We're the number one uh, tax consumer good. It's all about paying taxes. So the federal government taxes us, the state taxes us, you get taxed. So it's all about making sure you're doing it legally, safely, and then of course paying all the taxes that are associated with it. So we put your still under our federal license, done it by the book, everything's kosher. We filed all the paperwork, so we should be good. Okay, thank you for taking care of us. Yes, <laughs> but then, you know, once we make this alcohol, if we do consume it, we gotta pay taxes on it. Add that to your bill of how expensive this project is. Yes, <laughs> thanks government. All right, so we got all the pottery glazed up and loaded up with the fermenting garbage. And, mmm very garbagey, but also alcoholic. So I think that's pretty promising. So now we have the distillation guy here. We have the boiling pot below. And then this guy is a little bit of a lip. Whereas alcohol condenses on the outside of it, will go out the nose. And then we have the beautiful dumpster that Laura made that uh, will be housing our heat source, a dumpster fire. <laughs> uh, let's get set up and start distilling. Thanks to Studio Distilling, we're now able to produce our moonshine under their license and avoid breaking any actual laws today. Now two weeks later, with the mash fully fermented, we can begin distilling. I'm gonna use some glass beakers just so we can see the final result as it comes out. After the first round of distilling, let's run it through a second time and see if we can get a pure result. Trashed. <laughs> All right, so for a few rounds of distilling, we have our trash juice. Uh, initially had kind of a, a cloudy shade to it, but that seemed to have settled out. I think it was just some of the clay that got dissolved into it. We're looking pretty clear. So in just a little still in the little uh, fermentation tank, we only get a small amount, but to make sure we got enough to actually taste it and enjoy, uh, did a kind of a backup batch. And uh, this is our final yield from that. Just smelling it, you can tell it's pretty strong. You wanna try it? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Let's give it a taste. <laughs> I would uh, stay away from anything flammable. <laughs> Good thing I don't have any cuts. Oh my god. <laughs> Cheers. The 2020. Ooh, that <laughs> strong. Yum. <laughs> I love it. Mmm. 
Mmm, so good. So good. <laughs> Can I have more? Oh, yeah, wait. I think that did a pretty good job. Distilling it. It's very, very <laughs> strong. <sighs> oh. <laughs> I think that's almost straight ethanol, because uh, there's not much flavor to it. Did you catch any hints of... <coughs> no Sorry. garbage flavor, just 100% alcohol. Tastes like college. Doesn't have a great aftertaste. <laughs> it does kind of smell like the mash did. It's a signature taste that we've yes. curated. Should we test it out? We can see if it's at least 50% alcohol by if it's flammable. It's a dumpster fire. Um, yeah, so we succeeded. We did get a concentrated liquor. That's a useful product. It can be used for uh, antiseptic, can be used to, for as, as, as a fuel. So not only is this good for dulling the pain, <laughs> it's also flammable and uh, disinfectant. Perfect for 2020. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Month of cocktail, hand sanitizer. Distilling itself is an important invention. Open the door for a lot more chemistry and other chemical separation and uh, discoveries. So, yeah. Thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the home distilling, I recently started a new channel that did some experimental distilling, attempting to turn candy corn into aged whiskey. So you should check that out if you want to see more. A defining aspect of the evolution of humanity is what specific materials they had at their disposal. An era system we've often exploited in the series is the concept of the stone, bronze, and iron ages. A concept based on the material that would be most commonly used by the civilizations at that time. But by that descriptor, what era are we in right now? In many ways, we're probably still in the iron age, but perhaps we're now in the aluminum age, the semiconductor age, or maybe the plastic age. But by material used by humanity today, concrete is the currently widest used material. Perhaps most accurately, we now live in the concrete age. Today we explore its ancient origins in Rome, <sighs> test out its strength compared to a variety of other building materials, discover how this new composite material became the backbone of some of Rome's greatest structural and engineering achievements. In the ancient world, many different building materials were used many that we've previously explored, from wood and stone, ceramics, cob, and plaster. In terms of building strong, lasting structures though, there's nothing really better than stone. The ancient Greeks became expert masons and hand-carved stones to amazing details for their structures. But such skilled and laborious work was expensive and limiting when you're trying to build a massive empire. So the Romans perfected a new material that allowed humanity to make its own stone in whatever shape they wanted, with the use of concrete. Before concrete, the next closest material was plaster, used as early as 7500 BCE. Plaster is made primarily with lime, which reacts with the air and cures into calcium carbonate, effectively turning into limestone. Where because the reaction requires direct contact with the air, plaster can only really be used in thin applications, such as a mortar between bricks or as a thin outer coating on walls. Eventually, it was discovered that the addition of a volcanic ash changed the properties of the plaster and resulted in a new material that was five times stronger than mortar. This new material was not dependent on the exposure to air and could even set underwater. The cause of this is a different chemical reaction that occurs from the sacilic acid that's in the ash, the end result being calcium silicate hydrate. This new compound is called cement, and when mixed with an aggregate, which is just small pieces of stones or pieces of ceramics and bricks, it produces an even harder compound called concrete. This concrete allowed the Romans to build amazing structures from bridges, roads, aqueducts, monuments, temples, and even the Colosseum and Pantheon. Their concrete proved to be so resound, many of them are still standing today some 2,000 years later. The modern form of cement, Portland cement, was invented around 1840 and replicates the similar properties of the volcanic ash of Roman concrete, but instead using fly ash made from coal. So to unlock this incredibly useful material in my future civilization building endeavors, I'm going to need to collect and produce a few ingredients. First up, the most important ingredient, the volcanic ash. For that, while in Utah this fall, I returned once again to the Black Rock Desert Volcanic Field, where I collected obsidian several years ago. Both obsidian and pumice are formed from the same volcanic activity, where a liquid rock cools rapidly before it can crystallize. If this occurs under pressure, it forms volcanic glass or obsidian. I'm back at uh, the site where we got the obsidian. before. Only had a Prius, so I wasn't able to make it quite as far up. So here I am. This appears to be the actual cliff side that all the obsidian came from. Uh, this is what it actually looks like. 
in his raw form. So let's take a closer look. So I had a few people comment that like you don't just find an obsidian in a big field like that, and that's because it was taken from this first. So this is what it looks like in the raw. You can see he's got just got a bunch of little crystals in here. I assume a lot of the more pure and large stuff got mined already. So this is a little less rich. So you have a lot of banding of other minerals in between it, which creates a pretty, pretty cool look. But for actual napping, it's not the greatest, which uh, promote it breaking at not where you really want it to break. If you actually want to mine it from the earth, get a few chunks. Some chunks straight from the cliff. Hard to get big chunks off of this. They all kind of break apart. Just get that guy right off. Lots of uh, flicking and layers in between it, so really not the greatest for napping. There's glass in my shoes now. Cool. If it's not under pressure, the rock will foam and froth as gases escape and cool into pumice stone. This is why you can actually turn obsidian into a foamy pumice by reheating it when it's not under pressure and make foam glass, which I just found out can help stop a bullet. The obsidian that stop these bullets. I guess obsidian is bulletproof. Historically, Romans used plentiful volcanic ash they had access to near the city of Pozzuoli and called the ash Pozzolana. It's the highly porous glass in this ash that makes it so effective in their concrete. So this pumice should yield the same result. Just cow poop everywhere here. So one of the important ingredients for making Roman cement was the volcanic ash they were able to find in Italy as one of the active volcanic sites. So I'm back here in Utah. This is actually super close to where we originally got obsidian several years ago and used for a few different experiments. This is a deposit of pumice. So the same volcanic activity that produced that volcanic glass also produced this pumice, which is a form of volcanic ash. It's very easy to tell what it is because it is super light, very uh, porous. So it makes the rocks super light. So this thing is only like barely a couple pounds. Ooh, makes me look a lot stronger than I actually am. So some of these might actually float if we put them in water. So I'm going to collect some of this. We can grind it up and see if we can add it to our mix to make cement. Now I'm going to demonstrate my awesome strength and lift this giant boulder above my head. I mean, to my waist. <laughs> Overconfident. <laughs> I'm gonna lift this giant boulder. I'm so strong. <laughs> Look at me. I'm so strong. All right, let's get some rocks. I have a few different variety of sizes here. As long as it's light, it should be good. There is something kind of silvery in some of this. I wonder if there's potentially something else in here. It's also good for exfoliation. Maybe take a look, see if there's anything good deeper. Yeah, I don't see much better down below, so let's collect what's at the surface here. There's a little bit of obsidian. Interesting stuff. Ooh, look at that big beetle. That big beetle. Besides that area in Utah, I've also collected a similar pumice material in California, which I previously used as an abrasive cleaner during our murder scene cleanup video. It looks pretty good. Let's see what it's like with just water. Uh, kinda comes out. The pumice I helped quite a bit. Pretty much good as new. The formation there is more brittle and doesn't form as solid rocks, so it is more accurately called pumicite but it's composed of the same porous glassy material. Made it up to the old Dutch cleanser mine. All we had to do was climb this 500 foot cliff here. No, don't, don't show the car. It's a uh, mine of pumic stone. Uh, sometimes pumice, 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 something like that. I'm gonna go check out the mine, collect some uh, pumice. One wrong step and bottomless pit. There, this is the rock I wanted. Let's get out of here. Next, we need the lime a useful compound I've made in past videos from glass to soap making. Starting from a source of calcium carbonate, such as limestone, it is first baked at high temperature for several hours, driving out carbon dioxide from the limestone and yielding quick lime or calcium oxide. Then by soaking in water, this produces calcium hydroxide or lime as a precipitate.
So this should be pretty much all the ingredients we need to make Roman concrete. We have the various volcanic ash I collected. We have the pumice from Utah and some of the pumicite from California. So we need to crush that up. We'll mix that with the lime that we made by baking limestone. And then we have some aggregate, which is basically just some rocks. And one of the secrets they discovered in the Roman era was to use as little water as possible. So we'll try to make this very thick and doughy. Pack it into some of the brick molds and we'll uh, make some test bricks so we can then compare it to other building materials of the era and see just how much of an improvement this material actually was. Need a bigger boat. Roman concrete has now set and it's gotten hard. One of the theories of why Roman concrete has kind of outlasted modern concrete and held up after many millennia is the uh, interaction with the volcanic ash in it. It actually dissolves when it gets exposed to salt water and replaces it with a compound known as aluminum to bear to bear aluminum toborite, something like that, um, which is basically an even harder substance. It makes it an even more resilient compound basically as hard as rock. It's a process that took years and years to actually do the replacement, but we're gonna try and see if we can get some results. So we got some real salt from Utah, from an ancient sea that dried up. So we'll add that to the water and recreate our own sea. See if we get any improved results soaking in the salt water. It'll take some time for this chemical reaction to actually happen, so we'll have to revisit this brick later down the line to see if any noticeable changes to its strength can be detected. Our test bricks have now dried and solidified and should be done curing, and we should be ready to put them to the test. So for that, we have a hydraulic press here. It's going to put up to 12 tons of pressure onto it. We've got about 10 different samples we're gonna try out and see how well they each stand up against the pressure and see what is actually the strongest. So first up, we got some wood, two two by fours to kind of replicate the same thickness. This one is probably gonna hold up pretty well. It's organic and it's got a lot of give to it. Ultimately, the disadvantage with wood is that it's both expensive to have to harvest and grow all of it. It's also not permanent, whereas concrete will theoretically last forever. Ooh, start to give. Oh yeah, we cracked. Next up we have cob, one of the oldest building materials in the world. It's a combination of clay, sand, and straw. Not expecting too much from this guy. Let's see how well it does. Call that. The guy's pretty well smushed. The car seemed to actually give it a fair amount of durability. It's still holding shape, but definitely smushed a bit. Next up we have the sun-dried bricks. These are just basically clay, a little bit of sand. Similar to the cob, just no grass. This guy I expect will probably just shatter pretty easily. 
or disintegrating. Yep, I think that's about it. Dust. Kind of disintegrated as soon as enough pressure was applied. It's pretty rigid. So then this one has been actually fired, which is about what they were doing around the Roman era. The firing of it should have vetrified, maybe a little bit stronger. Already breaking. Then, yeah, we're done. Pretty similar to the sun-dried one. Shattered pretty quickly. All right, so the other ones were just my own homemade bricks. This is a professionally made one. It's a little bit denser, I can already tell. Has been fired. Five. Ooh. Brick snapped. Ooh. Started to crack fairly early on, but overall it stood together and held most of its shape. My brick making has, has some room for improvement. So next up we have plaster. But one of the issues with plaster is that it only hardens and cures when exposed to oxygen, which means when you try to make bigger things like a brick, it's uh, not gonna cure on the inside. So I expect this to fail pretty easily and the inside might even still be wet. Not gonna expect too much from it. But yeah, we're uh, pretty quickly disintegrating here. The transition from plaster to concrete was pretty significant. We have basically what concrete is trying to replicate and that's stone. It's just a block of limestone. Limestone is kind of flaky. Might not even be as strong as actual concrete, at least modern concrete. So this will be kind of comparable probably to our Roman concrete. Mm. Already broke. So next up we have our actual Roman concrete. And this stuff is Definitely a bit firmer, probably heavier than most of the other ones. Maybe the modern brick is about as heavy. Um, the interesting thing is it's, it is lighter than modern concrete. They might have to do something with the volcanic ash, which is a little bit fluffier. And it might affect our uh, our strength. It's not really one detailed recipe for Roman concrete. So I tried a few different combinations. This is one of them and we'll see how well it does. It seems pretty solid, a little dusty, but it's definitely cured better than just the plaster did. don't have the advantage of years of training to learn how exactly to perfect it. We have uh, modern concrete here. You can see how that compares to the ancient recipe we've been experimenting with. I suspect the result's gonna be a little bit better. It's definitely a bit more durable. So our Roman concrete wasn't quite comparable to a modern high-tech concrete, but it is still a very useful building material that we can start using for a lot of upcoming projects. We're gonna be revisiting crushing olives. So we're gonna build our own press the primitive way. And one of the key components of that will be our concrete, which we can start pouring now. Let's so tweak our recipe a little bit, open up some new doors rather than having to carve stones and save some manual labor. Thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. I wanna see us continuing in our advancement through civilization. Support us on Patreon. We really need your help. Thanks for watching. In this series' ongoing quest to rebuild civilization from scratch, one advantage we have is future knowledge about diseases and germs and the importance of hygiene when you live in a world where you still haven't invented medicine. We're going to dabble in some caveman chemistry and unlock one of the last remaining simple machines and utilize its power to crush olives into oil. We're getting clean with the help of the ultimate clean substance, soap. We previously covered soap making several years ago, but now within our confines of our reset and rebuilding civilization, this is going to introduce some new challenges and tools we'll be limited to. However, the science behind soap and why it is such an effective cleaner has remained the same. You've heard the term that oil and water don't mix? Well, they do when soap is used. That's because one end of the soap molecule is hydrophilic or water loving, and the other is hydrophobic, water hating which makes it a perfect middleman between these two chemicals. These molecules in the soap bind with the dirt and grease, allowing the grime-saturated molecules to wash off. Soap does a great job of getting rid of grease, and that has to do with the fact that it's derived from fat itself. Soap is made when the fatty acids from animal fat or plant-based oils mix with an alkaline solution, forming a fatty acid salt. In this process, called saponification, the alkaline reacts with the fatty acids, and they neutralize each other. The resulting chemicals are soap, water, and glycerin. First up to make the soap, we need to do some basic chemistry. First, gathering the basic ingredients. Limestone rock from along the Mississippi River, and the salt from a specific lake in Wyoming. The first step for our chemistry is to turn the limestone I collected, which is composed of calcium carbonate, into lime, or calcium oxide. 
For this, you need a big hot fire with a limestone added. Once hot enough, the calcium oxide thermally decomposes through a process called calcination, which liberates a molecule of carbon dioxide and leaves quick lime. Last night, I threw some limestone into this fire, burned it down for quite a while, and that should have fired it into lime. So now I should be able to react this with water and dissolve it, and that should produce a compound called quick lime or slack lime. Mix this water, the lime turns into calcium hydroxide, which is not very soluble in water. So by straining the solid precipitate, remove any water-soluble impurities. Got the lime all separated now. So next, we'll make the lye. So we're gonna combine it with the soda ash from the natron. So we have the salt we dried out from the lake water we collected in Wyoming. The lake water from the specific lake contains a large portion of sodium carbonate or soda ash. Soda ash is a weak base, which itself could be used to make some primitive forms of soap. But for a high quality solid bar of soap that we're used to today, we want to chemically react it with the lime and produce lye, which is much more caustic. So I'll just rehydrate it in some water, and then we'll add the lime, and we should get our lye. At about nine. Yeah, we're already starting out pretty strong. All right, so now we add the lime to our saturated natron. And the result of this should be an exothermic reaction, so it should heat up as it reacts. It's getting warm. All right, so it should have reacted now to produce lye in the solution and calcium carbonate that uh, settled out. So now we'll just strain it, and the solution should be just our lye. Still floaties. Then over a low heat, we evaporate off the water so we have a solid powder of lye to make our soap with. With the lye made now, the main other ingredient we need will be an oil or fat to react it with. We previously explored the process of pressing olives with the use of the simple machine, the lever. But now, further along in history, it's time to rebuild the oil press with some of the latest technologies of this era. A new simple machine called the screw, as well as a new material to use concrete. For some inspiration, we're looking at this oil press from Cypress, made with a wooden screw held down with a wooden frame and a concrete foundation. Let's start by first making the wood frame. All right, so at this point, the uh, sawmill I'm working on is a little, little undeveloped, just a hand saw at this point. It's gonna be a, a bit of a long-term project. Let's see if I can fix the focus a little better, maybe cut. Oops. Now that we need to process some wood, we're going to use our newly forged Viking Age axe that uh, should help us heal up some lumber. Should be a little bit quicker than the saw. Once there's some water power, it'll be a lot faster, and, uh, or at least a lot easier. Set it and forget it. Instead of chopping a fresh tree, we're going to reuse some old lumber. I got some old railroad ties and uh, provide some better wood than the random down trees we find that have been half rotten in the past. While we work on the frame, Lauren got started on crushing the olives using an also recently made tool, the mortar and pestle. Oh, <laughs> went a little hard and smashed the pit. <laughs> I think it's all in the flick of the wrist at the last second. <laughs> Now for the screw.
All right, so cut this fresh limb and rounded it off. And got it as even a diameter as I could. It's not perfect, a little bit of bend to it, but overall it should be uh, close enough. We're making a very coarse thread on this. Um, later on, more sophisticated methods of carving very intricate and fine threads were developed. But at this point, they're mostly just hand carved. So that's basically what we're gonna do. I'm gonna measure out at very large intervals and make a spiral groove down the whole thing using just hand chisels and files to uh, basically make a very large screw. And that'll go into the oil press and allow us to apply a fair amount of pressure to our olives. All right, so I did a bit more chiseling to get the uh, screw a little bit more defined and deeper groove so it can hopefully pass through the threaded top of the press. So Lauren crushed roughly a thousand olives. So now we can put them onto the little trivets we made before. Last time we did this with a lever, which was a little bit tricky, trying to balance it and put all the weight on it. So this time should be a little bit more straightforward. A simple screw should allow us to apply a pretty substantial downward force by just screwing it in. So let's give it a shot and see what we get. For some extra fragrance, we can harvest some lavender flowers. I got some in my nose. Now to combine all the ingredients to form the soap through a process called saponification. Well, Bill and I are going to make the soap using the lye that Andy made, some water, the oil that we pressed, and then we're gonna add some lavender for our scent. Mix it all together. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> all right, all right, Bill. You, we got your close-up. So when you do mix the lye with water, it is caustic. So, <laughs> ha. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna slowly and carefully add the lye to the water and not the other way around because it is dangerous. You may wanna be very careful not to breathe in these fumes. And if you're doing this at home, make sure you have proper ventilation. All right, so as you're stirring, the vessel is gonna heat up. I don't know if you can see, but there are fumes coming off of this. Blub, 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 blub. All right, now take this guy. Slowly and carefully stir him in. It is saponified. Forbidden soup. Okay, uh, not entirely sure that this is working. Unsure of the results of the first attempt, Lauren gave it a second try, this time mixing the concoction for a much longer duration. Okay, that's enough. Doesn't lie, it used to dissolve body. Broccoli cheese soup <laughs> on a cold day. Mm. <laughs> Come get your soup, Daniel. <laughs> okay, so that's gonna be a little test. Pea soup. Gotta get all the goods. <laughs> so the soap hardened over the weekend and we are now going to remove it from the mold. This example mold, ooh, it just came right out. 
made this little test batch to see how we can cut it and make sure the consistency is right so that when I slice it, it doesn't crumble. Nice, that won't be too bad. This one definitely turned a lot better than our first couple attempts. All right, so I think the reason that this batch didn't really work out very well is because we did not mix it well enough. The first pours were definitely a lot more olive oily because it was at the top. And then as I continued to pour, the rest were just this sediment of lye, which is definitely caustic. But this one, we took our notes from this failed attempt and stirred it a lot. And this caused the soap to saponify, and that definitely helped and made a more uniform blend as when we poured it in the mold, worked great. You know, ultimately we're gonna want it to be just neutral as it's a soap. So we're gonna test the pH of this water just to see that we have a fair starting point. All right. So that's good. Should be about a seven, which is neutral. I'm gonna take some of the soap, get it into here. <laughs> okay, science. Boink. Yeah, about the same. Neutral. Oh, I hate that. Okay. Mmm. <laughs> All right. So it's not great. I don't have high hopes for this, so I'm taking precautions. Okay, let's test this guy. Okay. I would not use this on my skin. I feel a bit more comfortable with this one. Much better. Some of the strip, it's a little splotchy, so it seems like some of the lye might have survived the saponification process, but I think it'd be safe to use it. All right, so we got the baking grease. Gonna apply a little bit to each quadrant, see what the most effective way of getting it out is. All right, try to wash the grease out with just water. Doesn't seem to be having much effect, but we didn't think it would, so. Okay, some of our cursed olive oil soap. Nice leather. Huh, run some of this guy on here. Okay, yeah, seems like it's working, even though it doesn't suds. Store-bought, definitely a different color. Definitely more lather. Okay, let's see what they look like under the microscope. So we're gonna start with the one that we just rinsed off with the water. Ooh, okay, olive oil soap. Wow. It doesn't look like it got any cleaner. There's still a lot of specks and stuff. Okay, coming in hot, our better soap. Ooh. Okay, well this sample doesn't have, you know, the black specks that we saw in the other one. Looks pretty clean. Clean hair follicle. Love that. Now, store-bought soap. Looks like a clean piece of hair. Looks the same as the last one, so that's good for us. I think it was pretty successful, which feels good. And, I think our football is pretty happy about it. If you want to see us make things like this in the future, please support us on Patreon. With that, we've now unlocked the final simple machine, the screw. Used in a device, they'll eventually be adapted for the printing press, but that's gonna come a lot later. Next up, let's level up on some of our iron tools. One of the oldest and most useful tools is the ax. Through the series and working our way up from the Stone Age, we've made axes of various forms and materials now. Napped flint, ground stone, cold work made of copper, and several cast in bronze. Now in the Iron Age, we have an even better material, iron. So we need to forge a new one inspired by the emerging marauders that wrecked havoc, the Vikings. While we were in the Bronze Age, the last axe I made was a replica of the largest Bronze Age axe ever discovered, found in modern day Denmark. Today, we're gonna make its younger cousin that these same Northern Germanic people made some 2000 years later. Starting in the eighth century, these expert sailors would begin expanding outward and be known for raiding and pirating surrounding lands, where they would become to be known as the Vikings. All right, so I'm back with Adri, who previously helped me with a few other projects. We made a sword, we made a saw, we got a few other ones coming up, and today we're gonna make a Viking axe. So this is a reproduction of a Viking axe made by Arms and Armor. It is a lot different than what people think a Viking axe actually is. It's a lot smaller, it's a lot lighter, but there's reason for that. Viking axes would only use the high quality steel right down at the bit and use wrought iron for for the rest of the axe. That way they can save their good steel and still have a functioning tool. They would use these from the kitchen to the battlefield to find woodworking. They'd use it in every single aspect of everyday life. Wrought iron and steel would both potentially be produced during iron smelts like the ones we've done. The steel would just be the portions of the bloom that alloyed with some additional carbon. 
the steel bits would be recognized as being the stronger metal and be separated for uses like this. We went to work forming the head of the axe. First, the wrought iron. We're going to fold the head onto itself so that the initial shape will be kind of like a butterfly with a blade split on each side of it. Once up to shape, we cut the blade off from the rest of the stock. We may have to go further through it. then bent it back over itself to make the socket for the handle. Then comes the challenge of forge welding the two halves together. At this point, we've been still using a more modern propane forge as I learned the basics of blacksmithing. But this more modern tool is actually a disadvantage when it comes to forge welding where you need a higher temperature to get them to weld. So after multiple attempts, we failed to get it to actually weld. A coal forge can reach a much higher temperature, making welds like these much easier. So to get this axe finished, I'm gonna to need to fast track the coal forge I've been slowly working on in the background. To construct it, I've been in the process of making my own red bricks. Assortment of bricks here now, varying quality. Definitely an art. That one looks amazing. Tricks seem to be to freshly wet the mold every time. Otherwise, they get sticky and less than quality. And it's just a matter of having the right amount of moisture for it to come out, but not too too moist. Otherwise, it starts to sloop a little bit. You don't get square bricks, but. I have bricks of varying quality. Let's let them dry and fire them and see how they turned out. But to get things built a little quicker, I decided to salvage some existing brick I had access to and repurpose them. To hold everything together, I'll make mortar out of lime made by firing limestone mixed with some clay. Then I'll need one more tool to build it, a trowel. I really need to make an anvil soon.
All right, so kind of just making this up as I go based on a few different examples I've looked at. So basically got it built up to the right height. The chimney will eventually go over here and out, and that will vent out all the toxic fumes and smoke. And then here will be kind of the work area. Got a scrap piece of metal that will hold the hot coals so I don't damage my bricks. And that'll be kind of where everything actually gets heated. It'll be a pipe with a bellows blowing into it. This will extend out to about here. It'll give you a little bit extra working space. And that's pretty much it. Kind of just learning as I go. It's a little messy, it's a little crooked, but I think it'll work. With it finally constructed, we can put the forge to use with the coal I collected in our video from last month and start forging the historically authentic way. With the new forge finally reached a high enough heat to get the weld to hold. Now I just need to weld in the piece of steel for the blade. Trying to weld two different types of metals together proved to be a challenge. We kept burning the steel shorter and shorter. After numerous attempts and having to switch to a new piece of steel, eventually got a weld that stuck. Next, it's quenched in oil. This helps strengthen the steel on the blade. Note to self, I need a better bucket. The last step is to temper it at a low temperature, which helps reduce the brittleness of the steel. While well, the blade tempers, let's make the handle. To help with our transition of bronze to iron, Adrian made us a new draw knife to replace our old one. They just started their own YouTube channel, so check out the full video of their build in the link in the description. Besides helping me with the forge, Adri also made me a custom draw knife to replace the bronze one we previously cast with Greg. Also lent me the shave horse to help hold the handle while we shave it down. Just make it nice and easy.
to test it out, I had Lauren go and try out the new iron axe compared to our two previous Bronze Age axes. This is just the regular bronze. All right, we'll give it a little, uh... <laughs> three chops. We got three on the board. If anybody wants this, DM us. <laughs> Okay, that was pretty cool. <laughs> hey! Oh god! <laughs> Maybe you should move! <laughs> yeah, this one is like pretty effective. Whoa! <laughs> this is nice. Okay, for this Browns guy, I'm just gonna do one chop, <laughs> see what happens. Alright, so this one isn't very deep, um, <laughs> more of a wound. Now moving on to iron. Alright, so that one's definitely. Way deeper. Whoa! Cool. <laughs> All right, we were well over there, and now we're over here. <laughs> now instead of chopping, we're gonna give it a good throw. You better get out of the way, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's my first try. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm gonna try the iron boy. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! All right, so here we have the completed Viking axe, all ready to chop and we can tell that it is definitely a major improvement over the bronze. The bronze ones have been very useful for cutting wood and getting everything chopped. The big disadvantage though is that they don't really hold an edge and I just sharpened it before it went out and I can already tell it's dulled. But now having an actual sharp iron ax is gonna be very useful for our, all of our upcoming projects. So we can use this for pretty much anything. Chop our food, chop our firewood, chop our enemies can do pretty much all of it. So to complete this, we had to build the Prick Forge. We got that made now so we can uh, really start moving forward with the blacksmithing and work on some more difficult projects. Now we've officially entered the age of the Vikings. No one be complete without a detour to try some of their drinks. This Viking baguette is actually one of my favorite things that we've made on this channel and absolutely delicious. It offers a really unique taste that combines beer and mead. It was really fun to actually try it out, make it over an open fire, and get to actually taste it in person. So with that, I've actually started a new business to try and offer this uh, experience experience to people and that includes this beer kit which basically includes all of the different grains you need the herbs for the groot everything you need to brew your own version of this unique drink so check that out to go on a little bit more hands-on with this tree let's get to the video in one of our previous videos we explored the origin of beer from its possibly accidental discovery and its pivotal role it potentially played in the development of human civilization while also making a few of the earliest recipes from these ancient cultures Today we explore some of the later developments with beer as we progress now into the early medieval era, a period of time that also coincides with the Viking era. Along the way we've also explored a few other drinks that compete with the potential title of the earliest alcoholic beverage such as wine and honey wine or meat. The biggest change from early historical beers to modern beers is the addition of hops, a bittering and antibacterial agent. But in between these non-hopped and hopped beers was an era when beer used an alternative for bittering and flavoring called Groot. I am Groot. Groot was a collection of herbs used in Northern Europe for this purpose and could be a variety of a few assortments of herbs that were available. Eventually hops grew to replace Groot sometime around the 13th century. Chiefly as a way to avoid taxation, the feudal lords were placing on Groot, but also because hops contained antibacterial properties. In today's video we're exploring two unique aspects of an early medieval beer. A Groot beer that is mixed with mead, making a drink called a Bregart. The idea of mixing beer and mead dates back to at least 1800 BCE with a reference to it in a Sumerian hymn to Ninkasi. A mixed drink like this would be prime for another culture of the early medieval period, the Vikings. For Vikings, ales and beers were very commonplace, but mead was held at a special place in their culture and religion and a mixed drink like this forms a nice bridge between them. To help brew this, I paired up with a knowledgeable brewmaster from a local Viking reenactment group. The main ingredient for this will be similar to past drinks, barley grown and harvested, and left to begin germinating in a process called malting. And honey, which we explored in our previous meat episode, with our own custom medieval beekeeping masks. Then, the new ingredients will be the herbs for the Groot. 
Whorehound, Mugwort, Yarrow, and Common Ivy. It's looking like a fire we can cook on. So I'm here with Joe, who previously helped us with making things like a Viking anvil and a sword, but he also has another skill of brewing, and today we're going to brew some Viking era beer. I'm Joe. I'm a blacksmith, brewer, and historical reenactor. Today we're going to be brewing a Viking Age Braggot, which is a combination uh, malted barley, honey beverage that'd be fermented historically, and then spiced with commonly found herbs and things that would, would have been grown locally, native to kind of Northern Europe. It's going to be made out of um, some malted barley, some caramelized rye, and some peated barley. And then we're going to start mashing it over an open fire. So now our kettle has reached strike temp. So that means the water has come up to about 150, probably a little bit more degrees. So what we're gonna do now is add our malted barley into the pot, and we will let this sit for about an hour, and this will cause an enzyme reaction within the grain to convert all that starch into sugar. And then we will have the start of our braggot wort. Perfect. Make sure there's no dough balls. My witch's brew. Okay, there we go. So right now we're doing the mash. It is the monster mash. Which is creating the nice kind of sweet grain water. What we're doing is waiting for a um, enzyme called amylase that is present in malted barley to take the starches that make up each little barley grain and turn it into sugar to create essentially a sugary barley water that then you can add yeast to and ferment it into what we know as beer. Eventually we will separate all of the grain from the wort, which is the unfermented beer. Then we will boil that down to our final volume for fermentation. And during that boil down, we'll also add the different herbs to turn it into a gruet. Historically, humans have probably been doing this for a very long time and probably discovered the process accidentally. But by the time of the Viking Age, they would have basically known that taking germinated or sprouted barley, then roasting it, and then doing this process in a uh, mash tun or louder tun would have created the beginning stages of a beer as we know it. And we've just made it more concise and scientific in the modern day. But historically, throw it in a pot of hot water and it just sort of happens. All right, so now we have a collection of herbs I grew to uh, add flavor. We're gonna do this without hops. It could be done either with or without. We'll start off with the yarrow, a couple of sprigs of that. When do we do the next one? Uh, that'll be probably in about 30 minutes or so. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Mmm. Wow, very sweet. I think this will turn out pretty good. We've already reduced it down by about an inch. All right, now time for the mugwort. I mean, a couple of those leaves or sprigs. I think that's enough. Yeah, looks perfect. And into the pot we go. It's like making a sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> the sacrifice to Govnu. Govnu is one of my favorite historical gods. He's yeah. the uh, god of blacksmithing and brewing. Oh, nice. So you get your guy. Yep, it is indeed <laughs> my guy. Now we're in boil over territory. Oh. <laughs> The beer. That is the downside of not being able to control the uh, heat super well. Yeah. Okay. Not spill this all over myself. Get my spoon. So we've definitely made a, um, a beer-like thing. So now she feels pretty nice on my hands, considering they're a little cold. It's gonna be a little grainy, but you know. It'll work. Yeah, it looks like that was a pretty successful mash, even using very rudimentary tools. It's sort of sticky and sweet, so it looks like we got some decent sugar extraction. So now we have the last two flavoring ingredients. We have whorehound and the ground ivy. Ground ivy I didn't, didn't even actually grow, it just kind of grows everywhere here. So it's nice to get rid of some of it. Nice. Now we're cooking. For the next ingredient, honey. So the honey will add a little bit of extra fermentable sugars to it. Also a nice kind of sweetness and body to the final braggot. That is thick. 
So we did the last step of transferring our wort into, this is not the last step. So we did the next step of transferring the wort into the fermenting vessel. Now all we gotta do is add the yeast and let it ferment. So traditionally they probably would have just let natural yeast get in and ferment it. But we have a, a few more options available and you have a very specific yeast you brought with. So this is a um, yeast that's a Norwegian kvike yeast. Kvike yeasts are really cool because they are wild yeasts that have been cultivated in Norway for all of these like farmhouse beers that individual families would have been making. And it has been recently sort of commercialized and become available here in the United States for the homebrew market. And so this yeast is fun because it's kind of an old wild strain that we can now use to create kind of an approximation of a Viking Age braggot and it should be nice and uh, quick and clean fermenting and hopefully will produce a really nice historical beer. Okay so we've been waiting outside in the cold long enough for me to throw a coat on but now I think the wort is finally cool enough to actually pitch the yeast in and let the fermentation start. I'm, I'm excited to see how this turns out. Yeah. It should be pretty good. All right, so it's been a couple weeks. It's a little bit colder out. And I'm back here with Joe, and he brought a few other people from his group. We got Ashley and Josh, and we're gonna try some of this beer. So we're the North Star Vikings, and we're a Viking Age reenactment group based out of the Twin Cities here in Minnesota. We focus more on the daily life aspect of the Viking Age, making our own garb, making our own weapons, doing Viking Age cooking, Viking Age beer, that kind of thing. You know, make all of our own stuff and pretend to be Vikings to the best extent that we can. <laughs> Some of the garb that we're wearing, it's stuff that, you know, we've made ourselves and it's very different than what you might see seen, you know, portrayed in um, modern media portrayal of Vikings. We are all portraying wealthy people with lots of silk and lots of silver. <laughs> it's all mostly based in Birka, Sweden. Birka in Sweden, it was a very big trading port. So this is a hat that is an Eastern style hat. This is what they were wearing in Sweden during the Viking Age. It's very Eastern influence. You have your weapons, your pouches, and they were much smaller than something that you would see like in the movies or even at the Renaissance Fair. The pouches that they had were very, very small. To carry something larger, you would have a bag, tunics and things like that. They were imported from the East based out of Birka trading. This is also an Eastern style caftan. All of the buttons are hand cast based off of an Eastern style button by Joe, but they're based on like more Slavic influences because they stretched all the way over into Russia. They did a lot of the plates that was a way to show your wealth. And then on mine, I have the tortoise brooches, which are the basic piece that would hold a lot of the Viking women's clothing together. And then you would also have your various daily implements that you would wear hanging from your brooches. You have your key to your house that shows that you are in charge of your house and that you carry that wealth. I got a little knife here and then silver and gold foil beads as a sign of wealth as well too. Rich traders. So this beer has been fermenting for about two weeks. Mash was extremely successful. We ended up um, creating what we think is a pretty high gravity beer. This could be anywhere from really low alcohol to up to probably like 14%. I'm guessing probably it'll be about 10% alcohol. Wow. We're not gonna have any carbonation in it, so it's gonna be relatively flat. When Vikings did it, would they have uh, tried to chill it at all? Is it just always room temperature? Probably would have been room temperature. If it was colder out, they definitely would have probably stored it outside. Also, beers historically were generally drank pretty quickly. They weren't aged for a long time. They didn't have a lot of good sealing vessels that they could have held it in. Fermenting this a little bit different than how you normally do with modern equipment. Do you think that's going to cause any interesting flavor? There's a little bit more of an avenue for spoilage with this type of fermentation. Mm -hmm. So it could be a little sour. But which would have been perfectly normal for historical beers. Um, as modern beer drinkers, we're not as used to that yeah. because we have modern sanitation and like glass and stainless vessels. But historically, almost everything they would have fermented would have had some bit of sourness to it, just mm -hmm. through the nature of them not understanding germ theory and <laughs> lactobacillus loves to live in wood and other things that they would have been storing their alcohol in. But drink fresh, it would have been less sour and it, the sour character will definitely expand over time. So I'm guessing it's gonna be reasonably alcoholic with still a little bit of residual sweetness and we'll get that nice kind of herbaceousness from all of the gruit herbs. So I'm excited to try it. Should we try it? Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. It smells so good. <laughs> yeah, right down. It's a beautiful color. Right like, down the hatch. And it's like um, cloudy kind of. I think that um, a lot of that color is 
the peated barley. Yeah, definitely not um, clarified at all. Definitely smells like it fermented. Skull. It's like a brown beer. Very sweet and smooth, very tasty. A British brown ale, like, mm. um, you know, like it, it has Friar Tuck on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that fermented well. That's alcoholic. That's really That's good. That's very alcoholic. <laughs> um, that is so good. I would guess, just tasting it, that it's probably in the like 11, 12 percent easily. Yeah. Wow. I could get used to this. Nice uh, job. Well, oh, that's real alcoholic. It's so good. <laughs> Also, there's some of that smokiness, I think, that we uh, pulled from okay. pulled from the fire. Like it's peaty, it's like... Peaty. Yeah, it's got a little bit of that peat character. Um, you can definitely tell that the honey fermented in there. So it's got almost kind of some mead notes to it. Mm -hmm. And you get those herbs. There's a nice bitter backbone to it that's definitely like the yarrow and I think the whorehound. And then you also get the kind of herbaceousness from that uh, mugwort and the... Um, Ivy, it's it's quite good. Like I think it balances out the sweetness. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I like it. It's quite drinkable. Yeah. That's good. That's a good beer. Yeah. Uh, we did good. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> we made beer. <laughs> Alright, so we used some modern equipment with a hydrometer to measure and uh, figured out we got about ten percent alcohol, which is about what you mm -hmm. estimated. Uh, so that's a pretty strong drink. I think it turned out really well, a lot better than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So thank you and cool. the uh, North Star Viking mm -hmm. group for joining us and uh, thank you to all our patrons. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. I'm pretty damn proud of that. It's a good result. Mm -hmm. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> we did it. <laughs> we brewed beer over a fire. Cool. That's very alcoholic. <coughs> like you get that, that ethanol bite. I was gonna say it's warming. <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching. Today, we are forging one of the most crucial tools for blacksmithing and metalworking. A request that's been very prevalent in the comments, an anvil and finally get passed by makeshift rocks. An anvil is one of the most important tools in blacksmithing and metalworking. At its core, it's just a large chunk of metal to hit against. However, the larger the anvil, the higher the inertia, and the more effective each blow transfers to the piece of metal being worked. Getting something strong and dense enough to handle the countless blows makes the anvil one of the most important tools of the blacksmith. So with this difficult forging project, I enlisted the help from some experienced blacksmiths we've worked with before, Joe and Adri. Be sure to check out Joe's work on Instagram and Adri's own YouTube channel. Alright, so I'm back with Joe and Adri, and we're going to tackle the next step of kind of a blacksmithing, which is making an actual anvil. Historically, especially in the earliest phases of iron working, you would have been working with very rudimentary tools and probably using a stone or a lump of bog iron or a smelted bloom that they'd compacted to continue forging their anvils. They would have found anything that would have worked that was large enough to absorb the force of the hammering and not suck out all of the heat from the metal. And stone makes a terrible anvil because of its thermal properties and how chippy it is. And it doesn't, yes, it does not, does not do well under hammering forces. Here these anvils were likely just rocks, like what I've been using so far. From there, some would be cast in bronze, something we did last year. Unfortunately, that anvil didn't survive long as it eventually snapped at a weak point in the casting. Andy has cast a bronze anvil in the past, but those, when moving into iron tools, really would have been short-term solutions. You can't really use bronze long-term as an anvil because you'll crack it or the heat will anneal it and you'll deform the face. Eventually, iron and steel became the preferred metal with early anvils basically just being a chunk of iron. As it evolved, more specific shapes were designed and formed for specific purposes such as the bick or horn, which is used for working curved pieces. In the 20th century, as mass-produced manufacturing techniques became more prevalent, the anvil has become a rarer and less familiar object. Today, most people are likely more familiar with its use in cartoons as a heavy object that is dropped on people's heads. This trope emerged as anvils were easily recognized as a heavy, dense object that was easy to draw. 
and then became a tradition of animation, even as people became less familiar with the actual use of an anvil. Today, we do not have a anvil stone, as it were, so we will be using a modern pattern anvil. Making this more Scandinavian style two-piece anvil is going to last a lot longer, and it's going to work out way better in the series when we don't have the time to continuously make anvils over and over. So where are you thinking? This would be our shoulder. Okay. Tones are gonna to be interestingly slippy. There we go. And that's what happens. Counterclockwise or clockwise? Now I gotta get in rhythm because I'm so used to following Joe. Are you you st right. you start? That was a good one. This works better. Yep. There's just that bend in it that's wonky. There we go. Ready to go. Yeah. And there we go. Pretty all right shoulder so far. We are square there, so I think that's good. Probably straighten her out a little bit. Let's just... like an anvil now though. Yeah. This is super close to a lot of examples I've seen already. It's definitely starting to look like an anvil. I think it's a very clean taper though. Yeah. I probably want one of these things for traveling. Yeah. Take one more heat with the flatter. Sounds good. Nice little mushroom anvil. I've got beeswax linseed oil. Linseed oil works. All this uh, is basically the scale that's forming in the outside soaks up the oil and it forms a protective coating like gun gluing. And then there's wax mixed in with it which melts in and seals it off to further protect it. This is definitely a steak anvil. Yeah. Turned out nice and flat. Yeah, nice and flat on the top. It'll do the job. With the first steak anvil done, next we moved on to the second piece, the horn anvil. Start working some of the hump. There's good instincts to pull your feet out of the way as soon as you start slipping. The blacksmith shuffle. Yeah, now that we got the first taper down, Striking. It was just striking. Just strike. Just a hammer. It's a hammer, indeed. Yeah. 
And that's it. Oh, got a good rhythm started. That, that was pretty good, actually. Everything was solid. There's not a lot to clean up. No, I'm honestly pretty proud of how that forging went. That's terrifying. Don't hit me in the head. It's a nice big horn, so if you ever do want to make a socketed spear, there's your mandrel. That log, you want it to burn itself and to have a really nice tight fit, but you don't want to burn away anything. So when you chisel it out, you don't split the wood. There we go. With the anvils completed, we brought them back to the studio. If you're like me, you might be wondering that if an anvil is just a heavy object to hit against, is an iron one really that much better than a rock? To put it to the test, I challenged Idri to try and forge the same thing on both the new anvils and a rock and see how they compare. Now we're going to try and compare and see what the difference really is between our homemade anvils here and a rock. This is a new rock after the untimely death of rocks one through four. So through this process, we'll be able to see what we're capable of, what the different tools can do differently, how many more options we have when we're forging, and in doing so, we're gonna to try to make a couple more tools for the coal forge. First up, the rock. <laughs> I wasn't even hitting it that hard. Finish out the heat, I guess, or not. Where's the next victim? Now if I can split this one, it's going to be hilarious. <laughs> this is honestly more tiring. Like you have to have intense focus to get it to stay on this while you're striking it. And it's not just because it's on a smaller log, it's because the surface isn't flat, so every strike you have, it pushes it back and forth. There's just one little nook that I can use to actually flatten things out. I think that's the best we're going to get, so it's not even worth trying to draw it out any further. Because this is relatively straight, and I, there's no way you're going to get it any straighter, so you might as well bend it over. You just have to make concessions when you're working on that thing. I think that's what we're gonna get out of this because I have no way to fix it. <laughs> now to try and forge the same thing using the actual anvils we just made.
You can definitely see more little dents and dings in the one made on the rock, and it's definitely not as flat when you look at the surfaces. A little bit about this anvil setup here. This is a fairly common setup to have a steak anvil and a separate horn because it's easier to manufacture. A lot of these parts can do really specific things that you can't just do on a block of steel or a rock. You can use the horn to concentrate your force on a smaller area, or you can use it as a guide to make round shapes. When you're working on the flat face of the anvil here, you know that you have a nice flat register and you can compare your work to the surface of the anvil itself to get a nice even surface all the way along. You can also use these edges where they're mushroomed out to part off pieces like we did here. When I took that and hit it against the side, what that did is create a tiny little concentration on this sharp edge. It helped me cut through without having to use a hot cut chisel. So between these two tools, you can make pretty much anything. We have made two different rakes out of the same material in the same forge with the same hammers, just changing what we use as an anvil. It's almost impossible to keep things straight and stable. Everything flies everywhere. You can't hope to get a square edge or a flat corner no matter what you do. Every single thing is a shortcut with how much the rock shakes. You can't go down into planishing heats and clean things up to get a nice smooth surface. You leave pock marks in your work all the time because we uneven surface the rock. Overall, it's just a way different experience. Even though you can make the same thing, it's a world of difference working on an anvil compared to a rock. A huge difference in effort. Every single swing I took on the rock, I had to really swing it because that's the only way I could get any metal to move. Working on our steak anvil, I had the ability to choke up and really think about where I wanted to move metal just ever so slightly. You can finish up and just get a smooth surface. I never want to work on a rock again. <laughs> Thanks again to Joe and Adri. Check out the link to see more of their work. And now with this crucial step in our blacksmithing, we can move on to some larger and bigger projects. Thanks for watching. When it comes to the important metals in history, a lot of emphasis gets placed on ones like bronze, iron, and steel. But the often forgotten cousin of bronze still had a very important role in history and was one of the key metals that was mastered by and helped to grow the Roman Empire. So in this video, I'm gonna explore the ancient method of producing this alloy. And along the way, I think we might learn to appreciate and love this metal. Let's make some brass. I've covered and worked with a lot of copper and bronze in earlier episodes, but brass has been easy to overlook. The copper alloy of bronze was first made as early as 3500 BCE and kicked off the so-called Bronze Age era. While brass was made as early as 500 BCE, well into the Iron Age. Comparing the two, bronze has a lot more advantages when it comes to tools and metals, being the stronger alloy. But these are also areas where iron and steel would eventually supplant it. For other applications though, brass has some key advantages. It's easier to cast, more malleable, and can have a more attractive decorative gold tint. The differences between these two alloys are the secondary metals they're alloyed with, with bronze being a combination of copper and tin. Brass, however, was an alloy with a metal that remained mostly unknown until much later in history, zinc. Despite not knowing what the other element in the alloy was or how to isolate it, it was discovered how to produce brass using various forms of zinc ore. The journey for making my own brass from scratch began a few years ago when we traveled down to Galena, Illinois. The main objective of this trip was to collect the namesake of the city, Galena, a type of lead ore, but also mined in this area were deposits of zinc. This is where our mine is. It is underground about 50 feet. It's 90 steps down. There's the Galena lead ore right there. When it's exposed, that's how shiny and bright it is. Lead in this area was prominently mined starting in the early 1800s, but most major deposits were depleted by around the 1850s. Zinc ore was found while digging, but had no economic value at that time. It was mostly just discarded. But starting in the 1850s, profitable ways to smelt zinc were discovered, and most of the mining switched over to zinc ore. This is where we're gonna talk about zinc mining. A lead mine, this one is about three-fourths mile, right? A good zinc mine, as they start expanding, could have several miles of passageways. I mean, if you add it all up, loads of zinc that you really want are one to 300 feet down. Lead ore 
50, 60 feet. Zinc mining continued to grow and eventually boomed during World War One, when there was a huge demand for zinc to make brass for ammunition. But during World War One, they were taking out millions of dollars of zinc in this region. After the end of World War II, though, profitability of zinc began to drop, and the last mines closed by 1979. said that we could still mine zinc if we wanted to in the region, hmm. but it's economically prohibitive. Well, this is the zinc sphalerite they're going to be looking for. Thanks to our trip a few years ago in the mines around the Galena, Illinois, we were able to collect some zinc ore. So the next step is going to be to crush this up and prep it for smelting. So the process of making brass is kind of a lot different than bronze, where with bronze you smelt the two metals separately, you melt the copper and mix the tin in and cast it and you have your alloy. With brass, because zinc isn't really feasible at this time period to be smelted, you're actually going to be smelting it with the copper. And in that process, in contrast to a lot of the other ones, there's not going to be a bunch of a liquid really, because the zinc ore is going to vaporize into gaseous zinc, which is then going to be absorbed into copper. And the copper will actually be below its melting point. So theoretically, throughout that point, we're only dealing with solids and gases. But once they mix together, we'll be doing that just at the melting point of brass. Theoretically, the result should be a puddle of brass and probably a fair amount of slag from the impurities in the ore. And then from there, we can just melt down the brass itself independently and cast whatever we want. We were able to collect a few different types of ore on our trip, but the majority were sphalerite, which unlike other ores, actually requires an initial roasting step, which helps remove some of the sulfur and break down the zinc ore before we can begin the cementation process. All right, so here we have our ingredients to do the smelt. We have uh, the zinc ore here, and I supplemented it with a bit of store rot, zinc carbonate, and just impurities from sand and such to kind of replicate it, just because we we're a little bit short, didn't quite have enough ore. And here we have copper. These are split up in a one to two ratio, so I'll mix them up, put them in the crucible, and then we just gotta bake it. With our crucible ready, we can now start the cementation process. Earlier this fall, I started building a kiln for making crucible steel, which I decided to wait until spring to actually attempt. The design of the kiln includes a tunnel which allows airflow into the kiln from the bottom, and should be able to use this kiln for this cementation process also. But the first step will be to defrost the kiln. Loading up and firing, I let it run for the better part of a day. While brass was discovered and known before the Roman Empire came to prominence, they were the first major party to truly begin the mass production of it. They quickly were able to produce brass in such significant quantities that they even began using it to strike quite common coins, such as the cestors. Brass production proved to be an important part of the Roman Empire's economy as it was a valuable commodity for trade and was used in many aspects of daily life. The gold-like appearance of the alloy gave the commodity an extra advantage in trade and was found to be especially useful in trading with neighboring regions, and was most likely a very key diplomatic tool when dealing with neighboring Celtic and Germanic tribes, who greatly valued this metal. This mastery in producing brass proved to be a very important tool for the growth of the Roman Empire, and its value in trade helped to cement the economic and political power of the empire. After running the kiln for a better part of a day, have the results. It is not necessary for the brass to actually melt. This could be still solid copper, but it does look like it melted into two nuggets, which is a good sign. It's hard to tell at first. Their color almost looked a little bit coppery on the surface. So I cleaned them up a few spots with just a wire brush to reveal a very distinct brass yellow color. And we have some normal copper here for comparison. You can see the very clear color difference. So we have succeeded. We have made brass. So next we're gonna melt down these two nuggets and cast it into a solid ingot. And then from there, we can start making some stuff out of brass. So in the end, the process of making brass is actually surprisingly simple, but also complex. With the knowledge we have today, being able to recreate it was actually surprisingly straightforward. And just a matter of hitting the proximate temperature and holding it for long enough. Hard to imagine how they would have discovered this way back then. It had to take a lot of trial and error to figure out just this random 
rock get absorbed into copper to make something that looks almost like gold. It's both fascinating that this is something that can be done without like making zinc itself and it's also something that they figured out how to do. The actual process of making zinc didn't come until a lot later. It's actually going to be kind of follow up to this is trying to actually extract zinc by itself. So there's going to be a video coming up relatively soon as we explore the historical methods of actually making zinc itself. But now we have brass and brass is going to be really useful as it was really useful in history to kind of commemorate how important it was to Rome and their economic abilities. I went ahead and I cast some custom coins for uh, how to make everything. I have a little profile of my face, say how to make everything. And then on the back, I have the language we made way back in the beginning of the series that basically just says HTME. And I'm uh, gonna send them out to our uh, highest supporters on Patreon. So at this point, I've now been able to cast a few different things in brass. And uh, before this, I've only really done copper and bronze and both uh, proved to be pretty difficult. Brass, though, it seems just so much easier. Just that uh, lower melting point just makes it just that much easier to get it hot enough. The few things that I've cast so far have turned out really well. And I look forward to using this metal for a lot of our upcoming projects. And as we start getting into more complicated machinery, it's gonna be absolutely crucial. And once I get a little bit better and uh, get the hang of cold working brass, it really opens the door for making sheet metals out of brass, which can then be easily turned into a lot of different tools or possibly even some instruments. But in the end, it's uh, a new metal to work with. I'm really excited for the possibilities it opens up and hopefully leaves us a little bit more appreciation for this specific metal. Thank you again to all of our supporters on Patreon. If you like our content, please consider supporting us. All of our top donors will be receiving their own custom coin of our own currency. Thank you again to all of our patrons. Thanks for watching. A few weeks ago, I spent a week in Utah doing a few collaborations and had an opportunity to collect a resource I've been wanting to get for some time. All it took was a mere 14 mile hike up a mountain just to collect a very precious orange dirt. But this dirt was an important historical key to unlocking the industrial age as this dirt can be turned into metal. So let's see if I'm able to collect some of the soil, take it home and turn it into steel. In my quest to make everything from scratch, metals have always been a challenge. Most abundant sources have been fully tapped or are currently owned and restricted from accessing. So for most sources, I've been limited to mostly low grade options like leftover tailings, being given a small sample from a now closed mine, low grade ore that wasn't mined, to even scavenging the concentrated ore pellets that had fallen off of trains. So a natural high grade source of iron ore has always been of interest to me. Bog ore is a type of iron ore that forms by natural biological processes that happen in bogs, allowing concentrated chunks of iron oxide to form in the right conditions. Historically, humans have been using this as a source of iron for smelting since pre-Roman times, and most iron from the Viking era was made from bog ore. Bog ore can potentially form in any bog, but it requires the right combination of a few factors to occur, so tracking down one in the wild could be a bit of a challenge. Fortunately, the YouTube channel Good and Basic were able to locate one in Utah and offered to take me back to it. Be sure to check out their original video where they first discovered it. All it should have been was a drive up the mountains and then a short hike to the location, but things then ran into a little bit of an issue. We're on our way to get some bog ore and we ran into a little bit of a problem as the road is closed still. Uh, I assume for winter, a little early in the season, I guess. Uh, so we're on our own to uh, go by foot. This is about seven or eight miles. So this will probably take uh, a good part of the day, but hopefully we can still succeed and get our iron. Trail moment in the forge. It's been about uh hours, about a half mile from the actual location. Just gotta trudge through the snow, sure about snowshoes. I'm almost there. Whew. All right, so it took about four hours. Made it up the trail, uh, hiking on foot. Very exhausting, it was 
a little over seven miles, very treacherous towards the end, lots of snow, got pretty deep at some points and lots of uh, kind of roulette of what, when you're just gonna fall in up to your waist. Snowshoes would have been nice, didn't expect that. <laughs> Not quite the trip I was expecting for this. Uh, but we made it to the bog, but now unfortunately it's covered in snow. It's gonna be a little bit hard to find the actual uh, bog ore because it's, can't really look for the red soil when it's covered in snow. So hopefully we get lucky. Hopefully uh, Joseph's memory of where it was at before works out and we can uh, track down some and uh, get out of here before it gets dark and cold and miserable. Let's uh, start digging. Hopefully, we find something. Found it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. Check it out, man. That was a little bit easier than I expected. <laughs> I do like it when things work. <laughs> Doesn't that look like a pile of rust? Yeah. That's rust. This is an organic form of iron ore. That's high grade, which means it's easy to smell with primitive means. So no wonder this was the stuff that fueled the Iron Age. You know, it's not gold, but every single time we find ore like this, I, I can't help but feel like, we've struck it rich, you know? <laughs> Now. Oh, it would not be good. <laughs> right now it's making lumps, and I suspect that's because it's frozen. It's a bag of rust. <laughs> but it's fancy rust. It's organic. No, really, it's, it's organic iron ore. This is easy to find, high grade stuff. So if you're gonna do it primitive, bog ore is the way to go. This place is amazing. Okay, now that bag goes in another bag. It might sound a little bit random to be looking for iron ore in a bog, but the way it works is actually extremely cool. There are certain types of bacteria that can actually consume dissolved iron, oxidize it into iron oxide, and there's a little bit of energy stored in the iron when they do that, which means they're actually eating metal. They eat dissolved metal, they turn it into rust, but as soon as it's been eaten and turned into iron oxide, it precipitates out of solution and it won't dissolve anymore. This stuff builds up. You get water trickling into a bog, you get acidic conditions, which are just right for this type of bacteria, and then you get the iron building up. And a second iron bacteria finds this iron oxide toxic. And so they will aggregate it together into lumps, kind of like coral. So if you run around an old Irish bog and stab into the dirt, if you feel a lump, it's very likely to be iron ore. Look how staining that is. Snow cone? Uh, this one's steak and kidney pie. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. Yeah. Golden. Thank you, Bogor. It's been a lovely trip. Then just the same seven mile hike back to the car, this time carrying the heavy load of ore. Meanwhile, while I was out gathering ore in Utah, Joe, one of the blacksmith and brewmasters we've collaborated with in a few videos, was preparing to do a smelt and was busy building everything he needed for that with some of his friends. We are going to be building the smelter stack today. It is bricks and clay, which provides a stable base for the rest of the smelter stack to sit on top of. As we're making it, we want to knead it and then form it into about softball sized balls. I've always wondered about today. life as a dung beetle, and I'm, I'm starting you're, to feel it. You're, li you're living your dung beetle life. I, I like it. All right, we're just going to start layering clay up against our form. We have uh, about half of our smelter constructed. It's now wrapped up to make sure all of our clay stays nice and wet so we can continue building up tomorrow. This is the end of day one.
now we are forming a clay tweer, which will be the um, air inlet for the smelter. This should hopefully be a more durable internal structure inside of the smelter that'll survive the entire smelt and keep the um, hot spot in the smelter right in the center where we want it in that reducing atmosphere. It's looking like all the ones I've seen on the internet. <laughs> Nothing non-phallic about it. <laughs> We are going to drill the hole in the side of the furnace that will be mounting our tweer in that provides airflow into the charcoal burning inside. We're gonna drill it sort of at a 20-ish degree angle. We want the tweer to kind of create a hot spot in the center of the furnace, but not be too steep. Otherwise it can actually interfere with bloomery formation and potentially even split the bloom in half. We have the smelter, this uh, bloomery furnace ready to go. The tweer is installed, the door has been tweaked, and everything's ready. So now we are just going to light a nice gentle fire inside of it to kind of cure up the rest of the clay in the internal shaft, solidify the tweer, and then tomorrow morning we're ready to light it up to actually start uh, putting ore charges in. Back from Utah, after a really grueling hike in the mountains, I was able to get a decent supply of bog ore. A lot of Vikings used for smelting iron. And I'm here with Joe, who has been working on recreating a Viking-style bloomery. Here you go. Hey, thank you very much. So we'll roast this up and use this as some of our charges today. We'll burn off the water, and we should see a bit of a color change as the oxides present themselves as much more red after it's roasted. I built a sort of Viking Age short stack bloomery furnace that should take about six hours total and hopefully at the end of it we'll pull a nice lump of iron. We do everything right and we're lucky. I'm creating a like four inch high layer of charcoal fines or charcoal powder below the tweer and this will give kind of a nice pre-filled area for the bloom to start consolidating on and forming that nice uh, liquid bed of slag. And once it's got a nice solid heat going we'll start adding um, two kilogram charges of ore and charcoal at a time. Hopefully six hours later, we'll be able to pull out a consolidated bloom chunk that will then uh, forge into something. And how much ore are you planning to put in and then how much do you expect to get out? Today, I think we're gonna charge about 55 pounds of ore total, but if we pull 15, I'll be very happy. I need to take a little out, which is where we wanna be. So much ash. I can't even see down there now. If we can all gather around, please, to a productive, efficient, Smooth running smelt. We shall offer some sage for the friend's wedding. Some very nice island scotch. And a sampling of the Avalor that we used last time. And more scotch. <laughs> the Wendy's bag really sells it in there. Yeah. The clanking method. Yeah. <laughs> You're offering up arm hair. If I have arm hair at the end of this, I've done something wrong. Imagine doing this all day. That's what apprentices are for. Can you imagine? This is how you had to make every bit of iron and steel you just worked As much as I'm a fan of it, I'm not a fan of it. There we go. Uh, I want a dragon, please. Come on. I know you're sticky, but get out. Oh, oh my gosh. There we go. There you go. Good color. I'll That's check the taste. <laughs> <laughs> By all means, <laughs> There we go. That's what we want. Yeah, I know. flowing pretty, pretty slowly. Now it's flowing. Yeah, a little bit. That's oh. probably a little too much. That was a successful flank down. Oh. This is now an ongoing problem. Open this back up and try to get a little bit more slag out. We're getting a little full inside. There we go. So right now we're seeing nice like liquid silica. I'm looking to not, I don't see any sparks, which is good. It means there's not a lot of iron coming out in it. In fact, uh, now we are going to call that done for a little bit. The hot spot is where we want it to be this time. This is a much yeah. better slag composition. That's really yeah. good. Again, we learned a couple things. So that was our uh, third successful slag tap. As the slag builds up in the furnace, it'll start to block the airflow from the tweer, 
So we're essentially removing it to provide more room for more slag to fill it. The slag is mostly silica, other um, elements from the smelter stack itself, as well as there should be a small amount of iron in there, which is actually a good thing. It means we're reducing it properly. So in there, there should be like little beads of iron. And eventually, we can actually run this back through the furnace and re-extract that reduced iron. This is our final charge. This will be our 34th kilogram of ore. And then we will let all of this burn down, open up the front door, and then try to extract our bloom. Did you break that brick on that I, it just It just happened. I mean, I'm a beast. The bricks are sacrificial. So right now we have opened up the door, birthing chamber, what you will. We're letting it free tap, and in a few moments, we're gonna start uh, digging around to see if we can't find a bloom. We're at the moment of truth. I'm very excited. And then I get to sit down. It's gonna be great. I haven't sat down since we got here. Oh, wait. To all who wants to watch this whatever the is gonna happen next, we're doing it. Conveniently, I think the bloom has migrated towards that opening. Yep, that's it. Because I'm sitting right where you're standing, so take a step back. Oh. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, Ooh. This is a All right, we've got two chunks. <laughs> Let's get some team. That's going to break off. So if we get perfect, Adrian, Dylan, David, Adrian, Dylan, David, and I'm going. Adrian, Dylan, David, perfect. Strike, 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 and pause. a success. We pulled iron. It's a little crumbly, which means it's a little high carbon. There's definitely some good mass there. I'm going to play with it now that I'm not feeling like I'm going to be lit on fire. Okay. Hey, it's arrived. It's still here. His nose is there. We did good. Good hammering, everyone. All of these are going to be pieces of iron. So right here is probably our single most consolidated chunk of bloom. If I'm going to hazard a guess. Hazard. Probably, I'm gonna go 10 pounds. Not bad. Is too high carbon bad for blade steel? It's an absolute bear to consolidate. So I may uh, actually decarburize this a bit. How do you do that? You bake it. Oh, that's very high carbon. Uh, I wasn't what I was shooting for, but it worked. So we did not make iron, we made steel. It'll be a lot harder to turn into a workable material afterwards, but it'll be a fun challenge, I think. So, honestly, successful. So in the end, we were able to produce a pretty large supply of steel out of this orange dirt. Thanks again to Good and Basic for sharing with me the location of this bog ore and for being willing to go on this really long hike with me. And thank you to Joe for his expertise in turning this dirt into steel. We're going to continue working with this piece of steel with Joe, fully work it into something a little bit more usable, which will likely involve turning it into iron and then potentially back into steel. Um, and I think this will be a good opportunity to do a, a bit of a deep dive where we explore the differences of some of the alloys of iron with steel and to kind of explore reliable ways of turning one into the other so we can comfortably say we've moved on into the age of steel so be sure to subscribe for that thank you again to all of our supporters on patreon thanks for watching and uh one last thing catch me at vidcon where i'll be next week previously i hiked 14 miles to collect a very useful form of iron ore bog ore which we then smelted down into an actual hunk of metal but because we actually ended up reaching too high of a temperature in the smelt, the result was actually more steel than iron, which initially sounds like a great thing, but that's in a state that makes it pretty much worthless as it is. 
In this video, we're exploring the relationship of iron and carbon and how to masterfully manipulate their relationship so we can produce the exact properties we want when and where we want it and make steel. Let's get started. First, let's start with some definitions. Steel and iron can have different meanings in different contexts, as our understanding of these metals has changed through history. We're working from a historical perspective, so let's start from that definition, where basically any metal that's made from iron ore is called iron. The earliest forms were from bloomeries, where a mixture of iron alloys would be produced of various carbon content. The workable section of the bloom, containing slag and iron alloy, also called sponge iron, would be reheated and forged down to a consolidated billet, and the result would be a very low carbon iron called wrought iron. Later, larger blast furnaces were capable of reaching even higher temperatures They were able to fully melt iron, which would then be cast in a similar way as bronzes. This result absorbed a lot of carbon and produced a hard but brittle iron called cast iron. Then, a little bit later still, a new form of iron was developed through a few different methods in different parts of the world. This new material managed to have remarkable strength. In fact, its English name of steel comes from a proto-Germanic adjective meaning standing firm. Most famous of these was the wood steel, which was made directly using a crucible, but I'll be covering that in its own video later. These different forms of iron and steel were known by their physical properties. It's important to note that while we can talk about their carbon content today, for most of history, its connection to the different alloys of iron were not that well understood, or the fact that steel was even an alloy. The carbon being added was mostly accidental, as it came from the heat sources of charcoal and coal, and at rather small percentages. In contrast, other known alloys like bronze were very clearly made by a combination of two different metals. It wasn't until the 1800s that the role of carbon started to become fully understood, and now know the relationship between these alloys which I think makes it pretty amazing to realize that for the majority of the history of metalworking, the many steps and processes of making and treating steel, for the most part figured out through blind trial and error. So wrought iron is generally less than 0.1% carbon, and cast iron was between 2 and 4% carbon. Then steel is the narrow band between them of 0.1% to 2%. Steel as an alloy has a lot of complexity with its structure with carbon at these percentages, but I'll get into that a little later. For now, let's explore the method of turning our smelted metal into something actually usable by decreasing its carbon content. I'm Joe Marcello, here again to do some more work with the bloomery iron that we produced last time. Because that last furnace probably got a little too hot in certain places, we have this piece, which has all of these really cool nodules, which actually show that the iron was fully liquefied at a point. What that means is it absorbed too much carbon. And so this is actually high carbon steel to even like on the level of cast iron. While steel is great, this is almost impossible to forge into something workable. So what you can do is use a smaller hearth to remelt everything and either add carbon to that material or remove carbon. And so we actually have to remelt this and strip a little bit of that carbon out of it, and it should reconsolidate into something closer to this, which is much more workable. So our last smelt that we did, we ended up pulling almost 15 pounds of usable material, some of it larger chunks and some smaller chunks, but it was a fairly successful run. And hopefully at the end of this process, we'll have probably about 10 pounds of really usable material that then we can forge something cool out of. We just need to get that clay dried out and everything else hot. Hey, we have fire. We're almost ready to start doing the things. Nice. This time we're running our really high carbon material we pulled from the last smelt in through to see if we can pull some of that carbon back out. So we're putting our first 150 gram charge in now. I'm gonna go find some more charcoal. Yeah. I think we're gonna let Moose take a uh, Randy swing at it. Hit it with the flat. There we go. Sort of where I wanted it. Now, why do you keep going there? Not where I want it, right there. Yes, please. Oh yeah, we got some good sparks. I do enjoy how much more relaxed this is than a full smelt, because there's 
a lot less on the line. All right, so we have one charge left. Last charge. I hope I put enough slag in there. So this could be good or bad. I hope it's good. I was gonna say, the one time where slag is a uh, positive. Oh, she's stuck. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a chunk of iron. Okay. Let me shove twist. All right, ready? <laughs> Why? Uh, and I'm just gonna have you strike. Oh. I'm gonna have to. Yeah, hit, break off that brick. Right, right there, keep breaking. Okay, and pause. You beat me to it. Rachel, Okay, perfect. I was eyeing. Hit pause. Perfect. Pause. Hey, why is it in my eyes? Strike. And strike on the top. That's where I wanted to hit before, so it's quite right. Yeah. All right, and strike there. And okay, uh, now we're going to switch to the end. Oh, that's my shoe. And she's still a little crumbly, but we have done much better. I think we would call that uh, So that is what we were hoping for. That looks a lot better. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So we ran our second run through the refinery hearth. We successfully remelted cast iron from the last smelt. Now we have a nice consolidated bit of bloom that should be slightly less carbon. At this level of refinement, we can actually take it to the forge, consolidated further to get rid of all the rest of the slag and impurities and drawn into a bar of usable material. And from there, we can make something out of it. It's still very hot. <laughs> Let's see, we're gonna put that down now. In a very similar process, more carbon can be added to the alloy. They would have taken this low carbon iron and re-ran it through a refinery hearth to add a little bit of carbon to produce like edge material for tools all the way up to like knives, swords, and spears and things. The amount of carbon that the iron will absorb sort of depends on how much oxygen is present where it's liquefied. But the tweer higher up, we have less oxygen where that bloomery iron will actually be melting. Once the metal melts, then it sinks below where it gets to sit in a nice carbon-rich environment. So it should have enough time to absorb some of that carbon dioxide into it and become steel. It is alive, it lives once more. Slag in there. All right, so we are putting in uh, our first charge of bloom. This one is gonna go right there in that hot spot. It is going to start to liquefy and burn out some of the slag and impurities. And we're gonna cover it with charcoal and it'll slowly burn down. Yeah, it seems like two pounds really is, for this size furnace especially, what it likes to burn through. And then it also makes it quick because two Two pound runs like this will make you enough material for a sword. If we are lucky, we'll get an 80% yield. Last one I did actually ended up with like a 95%. So we'll be losing slag and impurities, but we put in enough really nice consolidated pieces. I think we should be good. An hour and 45 minutes worth of work, it's not a bad trade off. At a certain point, we should also see some bright sparks coming out. This is going incredibly smoothly. Chunky. Where are you hiding? Haha. -ha. <laughs> oh, here she is. Not fully consolidated. Again. Let's see. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna dig around in there a little bit. Hey, the Tweer survived ish. Oh, yeah, it looks pretty good. So I'm gonna be looking for more really glowy bits, like so. Oh, that's toasty. Perfect, thank you. Hey, we found more iron. Yay, I was set the grass on fire. <laughs> Pretty impressive for a tiny little thing. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Better. 
Thanks to these extra refining steps, we should now have a chunk of bloom that can be consolidated into a bar of wrought iron and a chunk of consolidated steel we can use for edge pieces. Like what we did when we forged a viking axe with a steel bit. One additional way to adjust carbon content and make steel is called case hardening, which allows you to selectively turn the outer portion of wrought iron into hardened steel, allowing you to have a tool with the best of both properties. So first up, I forged some chisels out of low carbon iron with Adri. So we're just taking this and really pushing it out, start to form what will become the blade of the chisel. We're going to need to draw the whole thing out and make sure we have enough stock in the back to have a handle to hold onto. So now that's actually starting to look like a chisel. All right, so you got that initial bevel set in. We're just gonna compact this material in. And that's the chisel blade basically done. Yeah, that looks nice. There we go. Yeah, that turned out okay. And I think that's about where we want it. Now with three sets, we can do the case hardening. This method involves coating the low carbon iron in charcoal paste, then enclosing it in an airtight container. Then by heating it to a red heat, but still below the melting point, some of the carbon from the charcoal is absorbed into the iron, turning into a harder steel outer coat. This combines the toughness of iron and the hardness of steel into one tool. The next steps for heat treating the new steel is to quench it quickly in water or oil, and then tempering it by heating it to a low heat. What exactly are these steps doing? Well, that dives into an even deeper understanding of steel as an alloy and its crystal structures. As an alloy, steel is surprisingly complex with many different forms of crystal structures possible in it that impart different material properties. Over centuries, blacksmiths have learned to manipulate the crystal structures of steel, allowing them to adjust the properties of a single piece of steel. Working it while it's still softer and then transforming it into something harder at the very end. When a liquid cools into a solid, various points will start to solidify first. With metals, these different points each grow into separate crystal that once fully solid will become the grains of the metal. One simple way to manipulate metal is to control its speed of cooling, which can help change the size of the grains. But heat treatment is even more complex than that, and there are different forms of crystals that can form. Different structures of iron crystals can absorb different amounts of carbon. Pure iron actually does not want to absorb that much carbon by itself. In an alloy of iron and carbon, there is some combination of ferrite, which is pure iron crystals, and cementite, which is a compound of iron and carbon. However, they can also exist in crystallized forms combining these two compounds. By heating steel to a higher temperature, existing crystal structures can turn into a new structure called austenite, which is able to absorb more carbon. When cooled, the austenite transforms into different crystal types and phases that can be controlled by the speed the steel cools. Working the steel can put pressure and stress into the grains as they are manipulated. By raising it to this temperature and then letting it slowly cool, a process called normalizing is done which reforms the crystal structures. Rapidly cooling by quenching forms what's called martensite. These are highly strained crystals, super saturated with carbon that are incredibly strong, but because of the rapid temperature change contain a lot of stress, so they are hard but brittle. A process called tempering can then be done, which is slowly heating it and allowing the captured carbon and stress to be released, leaving you with the ideal properties of hardness and toughness. In your After all that, I have a nice set of chisels that are now hardened with steel on the outside, but still have wrought iron inside, which really produces the best qualities of both. So this video has been a nice experimentation and exploration of the properties of iron and steel. 
kind of a deeper dive. It's not something I've really understood myself. So it's been kind of a, a good opportunity to kind of understand what, what exactly is going on. I feel like I have a, a much better understanding and it'll be very useful in the future. And now I think we can definitely say that steel is unlocked and we can use it whenever we need in the future. That being said, the real steel age probably technically didn't begin until the 1800s, after the point where we had kind of developed our understanding of what exactly is making steel in the relationship with carbon. Then we inevitably were able to figure out better ways to do it, which resulted in the Bessemer process, which is the super efficient method that's even used today and is what brought down the price of steel from the more extravagant prices that it once was to the more affordable prices of today. It would really allow the modern steel age to begin. So at some point I'm gonna be definitely exploring that. But first I'm gonna be digging more into crucible steel and the, the most famous Woot steel, also known as Damascus steel. Thanks for watching and thanks again to every one of our Patreons. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. For the last video in this section, we visit one more unique way to work metal, drawing wire. I'm on this quest to rebuild civilization by building myself up technologically from the very beginning. Breaking into the world of electricity and electrical components, I ran into one minor hurdle, wire. Turning metal into long, thin pieces of wire has turned out to be a little bit more difficult than I expected, but let's dive into this and see exactly what it'll take to make some wire. I've actually done a few videos trying to make wire before. Several years ago, I did some gold dry panning in the desert with William Osmond and attempted to turn the gold we collected into a long piece of wire. The actual process ended up being frustratingly difficult, with it continuously breaking and losing really expensive pieces of gold piece by piece. Actually drawing it into a long piece of wire never ended up really working out. Later I explored a similar topic covered in the anime series Dr. Stone, where they addressed the challenge with a creative, although dubious, centrifuge device to theoretically produce thin gold wire using basically a cotton candy machine. My attempts to recreate this were quite unsuccessful as well though. Historically, this process has been done for centuries, basically using the same method as what I tried the first time with the gold wire. However, there were clearly some tricks I was missing. When it comes to historical methods of drawing your own wire, I basically found only one source online, Iron Skin. So I set up a call to talk and get some tips from them. I'm Sebastian from Iron Skin. We are a small business of four people and we help people with chain mail. So we do tailored chain mail, we help provide tools and instructions. So I did this whole video on trying to make wire before without much luck. I think my biggest issue is like I ended up starting with gold. It's kind of an expensive material to mess around with. What, what's your general advice when, when somebody's first learning how to pull wire? Before you start pulling, blacksmiths and shape it to somewhat smooth shape. So materials, some of them become very brittle after a short time of cold working, and that's what you're doing when you pull wire. Soften the wire by heating it up, that's called annealing, and you do that every couple of steps. Another mistake is you need to have proper drawing plates, and they need holes to be spaced in a correct ratio. You can't just go from a very large hole to a very small, they need to be, say, 10% or less decreasing in size. What's the largest project you've made with riveted mail? Most of the time I make shirts for large and for small people. Can weigh up to 15 kilograms. Add that up, a shirt contains about 30,000 rings. Uh, that takes me about two minutes per ring. <laughs> 1,000 for two minutes a ring. How long did that take you to do? Yeah, almost half a year. What we found most useful from his videos was the use of a windlass to apply extra power to the pulling. He also demonstrated a basic rig that holds the pliers tight while the rope is under pressure that greatly helped in this endeavor. Thanks again to Sebastian. Be sure to check out their website, ironskin.com, for lots of useful information on historical wire drawing and chain mail making. While tackling this topic and achieving a better success at it has been the top of my list, my new assistant, Elliot, had his own special interest in this topic and spent several days troubleshooting and figuring out how to finally achieve success in the process. I took some schooling in electrical engineering. Also, I'm just an enthusiast and hobbyist of electronics. I've been messing with them since I could turn a screwdriver. Wire in particular, I think, just has a lot of uses. A lot of people like the obvious one is chain mail. Small wire in particular means you can make magnet wire. So very high gauge, tiny, tiny filaments of wire, meaning you could make generators, motors, 
electromagnets of pretty much any kind. So there's just a lot you can do with magnet wire. The process is kind of insane. It's very laborious and it was a huge learning curve for me. First of all, understanding the annealing process. Honestly, I'm surprised it, it worked at all. <laughs> like, what we're gonna start out with today is just a scrap piece of round rod. I'd say it's probably some somewhere between quarter and a half inch round rod. The idea is we're gonna draw that out to the most narrow diameter we can. We're gonna start out drawing it out square, get that as long as we can, and then we're gonna knock out the corners, make it into an octagon, and then round that off to finish it off. But the idea is, is the smaller we can get it here, the less work we have to do when we pull it through the draw plates. So that's the idea, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so we've got our basic rod forged out. It measures in at just under four millimeters, so I think that's a pretty good starting point considering that was all done by hand. And then we have our basic rig set up here. The holes in this die basically increment, I believe in tenths of millimeters. And then what we have set up here is a basic kind of like tension system. So as this pulls, it'll tighten down on the pliers and hold them attached to the rod. Down here, we just have a basic kind of crank system set up. So I guess we can give it a try, see how we do. It takes quite a bit of force, especially when we're at this size of rod. And it kind of bounces around like that in the first few holes just because we've got some inconsistencies in the size of the rod. And there we are. We just do that about 40 more times. <laughs> This is pretty much our end product at this point. We figure we started at about maybe five inches of raw material and we've ended up with basically 50 inches of wire. So a 500% increase in length, not too bad. Final diameter I think came in at 2.2 millimeters. I'm pretty pleased with the result considering what we started out with. Also during the like hand forge stage, uh, getting out as many of the imperfections as possible before getting to the drawing stage is ideal. So finally, the rig I think has room for many improvements. It's incredible how much force it takes really uh, to pull this. At one point I was lifting up the entire workbench just to crank it. I wouldn't underestimate how much cranking power you need. So we just have another, what, half mile to go? <laughs> After the point of making actual wire, our project is going to kind of split in two directions now, historically. Wires used in pre-modern time was primarily for jewelry or for making armor with chainmail. The two fully cut rings are riveted together to form a nearly impenetrable piece of armor. It's an incredibly slow process, so actually finishing the armor will be part of a later video. For now, our focus is going to be on a more modern use of wire, electronics. So for that, we're going to want to use the more conductive metal of copper to draw some wire. Overall, the process is pretty similar to drawing iron wire, but potentially easier. Starting with a two inch chunk of ingot, we hammered it down to about two feet. Material. 
By slowly drawing it down through narrower and narrower draw holes, the wire was stretched longer and longer. at the end we reached over 40 feet long. It was at this point the wire started to break, so called it good enough, reaching the diameter of about a 16 gauge wire. To demonstrate the new potential that this wire allows for us, we attempted to construct a crude electromagnet. By wrapping the wire around a piece of iron and keeping everything insulated from each other through the use of beeswax and cloth, when a current is applied, it can create a temporary magnet that can be turned on and off by applying a current or disconnecting it. To power it, we brought back the original first battery we made last year, the Voltaic Pile. With our size of battery though, it didn't contain a lot of power, so the effect was pretty minimal. But it's enough to prove the concept. So we are getting decent voltage. That's like a 9 volt battery right there. Um, but we're operating in the order of milliamps. So improving the battery, not using bare wire would be nice because the more tightly wrapped the coil is, uh, the more power we're gonna get out of the magnet. And then just many, many more turns of the wire, I think would definitely help, but it works. The concept of wire is probably not the most interesting or fascinating. This little device really opens the door, especially when you use it to make things like the electromagnet. This is a fairly crude one that was uh, mostly just for demonstration purposes, but a little bit of refining, mostly by getting some actual insulation on our wire so we can wind it a lot more and tighter. And probably most important, getting a stronger battery, we can actually build some pretty powerful electromagnets. It is a pretty crucial invention for doing things like motors, generators, the telegraph. And we're actually gonna try and make our own telegraph system pretty soon here and basically invent our own very first telecommunication network. So this invention and process of making actual wire has been with us for centuries. And uh, it's only with like real modern knowledge we can do a little bit more advanced things with electricity. And it's gonna allow us to make some major jumps ahead in kind of the time scale we're in. That being said, we're still working on the chain mail and it's gonna be one component of the suit of armor that we're gonna be building and we're basically building that just to destroy it and to see just how durable some armor is. Kind of a different ends of the spectrum on the uses of wire from both durable production to eventually being used to help spread information at the speed of light. Thank you again to all of my supporters on Patreon. Thanks for watching. At the end of this, we now have a very solid grasp of Iron Age technologies and smelting and working with various forms of iron from wrought iron to steel, putting us several steps closer to the final goal of the series, a steam engine. The next marathon edit will explore the next steps as we begin our entrance into the age of industrialization, which includes both human-powered machining tools and capturing natural forms of power to put them to work for us, as we unlock the technologies and knowledge that allow the steam engine to birth the industrial revolution.